I need a copy of that. And uh, the email, John. I don't think so. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, and I think we'll start. Uh, it seems that, uh, first of all, I should say that if anyone, if anyone would like translation services, they are available. We have Mr. Bernard LaBelle back there, and I told Bernard, he's from Cove Head, that I hadn't seen him in a long time, but if I had seen him on as regular basis as I did for the better part of a year, about 25 years ago, we wouldn't even need him this afternoon. I used to have him come to my office to uh, teach me how to speak French, and the, one of the things I learned in that process was how talented he was, and how he would say things such as, well, just look at the word. You know, does it mean anything in either language, you know, Latin or French or English? But the thing that I did wrong was I had him come to my office, and I never got rid of the pressures of the office of thinking of what I'd just done or what I was going to do. But in any event, uh, he's here, and if you would like to hear my remarks in French, then just go see him, and if you would like to make any remarks in French, and just give me a moment and I'll put on the receiver. I can read a French newspaper, but uh, I can only uh, understand someone's French if uh, it's very slow and I know the topic that we're dealing with. Um, I didn't know if we are going to make it today. It seems every time we're going to have a meeting in Wellington, Mother Nature of the Elements. Uh, the last time uh, I drove up here and no power. I knew that before I left Charlottetown, but I thought it'd be fixed when I got here, and it kept getting worse and worse, the snow, and I think we had half a dozen people, and we had a nice little chat out there, and more people had left early, <coughs> excuse me, and so forth. <coughs> I just returned from Calgary for Easter, where I managed to pick up a cold, because our grandkids had colds. But in any event, I'm very pleased to be here today. This is the last of all of our public meetings. And uh, I calculated this morning that of these 15 meetings across the province, that if we could get 20 at this meeting, we would have 600. So I thought that was a pretty impressive record. Then, if you add to that, having spoken at the Federation of Agriculture, the NFU, the ADEP Council, Crop and Soil Association, and the Young Farmers, that's another 350 plus people. So just shy of 1,000 people um, at formal meetings or sessions, let alone what people have um, stopped me on the street, or and they've sent countless emails and letters and telephone calls and so forth. And Father, I don't know what goes on in the Catholic Church, but they're even nabbing me at the Baptist Church when I go to church, giving me pieces of paper, giving me comments or something like that. So it's, uh, it's been an interesting uh, journey as, uh, as we've traveled along. And uh, I just want to tell you what some of my goals have been. Um, I uh, have been interested in this matter for a long time. Um, interested, as Eddie Clark knows, and Tim Carroll in politics for quite some time, no longer actively involved. But um, the Lands Protection Act uh, is something that I, my association with is very meaningful and personal to me. And I'm also pretty interested in Prince Edward Island as a province. And that we are very blessed to have a separate jurisdiction as a province. And we came very close to losing our right to be able to deal with land in this province uh, about 30 years ago when the federal government of the day decided to 
decided to say that anyone could own property across this country. And if that had stayed in the Canadian Constitution, we wouldn't be here today. There would never have been a Lands Protection Act. It just wouldn't have happened. And uh, this young man is 32, Patrick Carroll. He's my scribe. And um, when I was his age, 31, I found myself Attorney General and in an, a debate with uh, Prime Minister Trudeau over this issue and uh, national television and that, along with other things that happened about a year and a half later, when the Constitution did come home, we were able to have that offensive section of the draft Constitution, Charter Rights and Freedom, removed. And as a result, we retained our right, as all provinces did, to deal with property and civil rights. Now, one of the things I tried to do when this process was being set up was, well, for want of a better word, I was going to do it my way. Um, I wasn't going to just simply have office hours and people make appointments, come in and see me. I didn't just want written submissions that were sent to me or emails, all of which were fine. And uh, um, Margaret, why don't you come up and take some water? Okay. The whole bunch of glasses, oh, you got water. Okay. You and I are going to have a competition here back and forth. Anyway, but one of the... Um, no, no comment. And, <laughs> and uh, anyway, one of the things that I wanted to have happen was I wanted other people to hear your comments besides me. I wanted a learning and education process to happen. And that can only happen if we share our ideas one with the other. And one of the things that I was convinced upon before this process started, and even more so since it's now come to a significant <laughs> end as far as public meetings are concerned, is that we have more things in common than we really think we do on some of these issues of which there are strong opinions. So that has been one of the things I really strive for, and I must say that I'm quite pleased that I think significant advancement has been made in that particular regard. You've been given these sheets of paper, and there's a little attachment there. And the first sheet of paper has to do with the terms of reference. What are the things that I have been asked to deal with? Well, right in the middle there, it says the adequacy of existing aggregate land holding limits. <coughs> given changes in the agriculture, provincial land use and ownership trends, and rural communities. Two, options for reducing red tape and regulatory requirements, while ensuring that the act can be effectively administered and enforced. Three, the legislative concerns that have arisen involving such issues as land holding limits as they apply to utilities, application thresholds as they apply to multiple owners, and the information and deeming requirements for nonprofit corporations. And four, any other matter the commissioner deems appropriate to review and bring to the attention of executive counsel. Now, it's been established as a public inquiry, but I decided that in order to have this inquiry be effective, I want to hear from members of the public in as casual and informal setting as possible. And some of you have traveled the roads with me. You've elected to come to a lot of meetings. And you know my style. It's reasonably casual, tell a number of stories, but usually with a larger purpose for a story. And one of the things that I really wanted to get across was for people to know what the purpose of the Lands Protection Act is. That's on page two. Okay? This Lands Protection Act, when it was passed in 1982, did not have this section in it. It was put in in 1998. And it says, the purpose of this act is to provide for the regulation of property rights in Prince Edward Island, especially the amount of land that may be held by a person or corporation. This act has been enacted in the recognition that Prince Edward Island faces 
singular challenges with regard to property rights as a result of circum several circumstances, including historical difficulties with the absentee landowners and the consequent problems faced by the inhabitants of Prince Edward Island in governing their own affairs, both public and private. The province is small land area and comparatively high population density unique among the provinces of Canada and the fragile nature of the province's ecology, environment and lands and the resultant need for the exercise of prudent, balanced and steadfast stewardship to ensure the protection of the province's ecology, environment and lands. So it's very rare for that type of statement to be contained in a law, but it is. And then we have a couple of little maps there, and they are miniatures of the large maps there that talk about amount of non-resident ownership, corporate properties, and so forth, and there's a little bit of narrative behind. Now, because we have translation services here, it's really necessary at this meeting more than other meetings that you come and use a mic for recording purposes and so forth. The But, uh, oh yes, the mics are not just recording for translation, it's also an amplification. And so that the, not just amplification, but they're also recorded and they're going to be posted eventually on the website. Okay. And um, so what I think I'm going to do now, is, come on in Mr. Perry. Thank you. Okay. He was at the National Farmers Union yesterday and he had to walk out during part of my speech to go to the house, and now he's back. The only thing is, Hal, I'm not delivering exactly the same speech as I delivered yesterday. This is closer more to the one in Kensington. So what, when you come to speak, I'm going to um, ask you to introduce yourself and so forth. Now, um, with your permission, I'm going to call upon Tim Carroll, because you were... Um, <laughs> Tim is a former Minister of Agriculture. He happens to be the father of this guy. But these days, this fellow takes instructions from me, not from him, for a whole bunch of reasons. Is Tim not paying him, and he's 32. But Tim came to a crap hole the other day, and Tim is a professor of business at the university, and then former Minister of Agriculture in the first Giz government. And because of the lateness of the night, and because I wanted to have the exchange between the PI Potato Board and those present go on longer than maybe some expected, um, Tim very kindly agreed that the comments he would make, he would do here as opposed to uh, Crapple. So I think it's only fair that we ask Tim to speak first. Welcome. Thank you. My name is uh, Tim Carroll, <coughs> associate professor at the University of Prince Edward Island Business School. Bonjour, Commissioner. How's that? Merci beaucoup. Oh, Good. Lovely to be here in Evangeline today. Uh, I guess just to clarify, uh, Mr. Commissioner, uh, today what I wanted to do is I wanted to report on some research that we've been doing at the University of Prince Edward Island on this whole question of how we get the existing farmers in a position to retire and open up uh, uh, the land base or assets to a new generation coming in. And so I'm going to kind of keep my focus there, but I just wanted to say as a citizen of Prince Edward Island, like you and like many of the people you've heard from at this meeting, I do have my personal opinions on the Lands Protection Act and, uh, and how I feel about that and what should happen with it. Are we going to hear any of those? Uh, I, think, I think I'll leave that till the end. Okay. And I would just like to uh, go through this uh, very quickly, if I can, on, on the work we've been doing. So when you're looking at a new generation getting into agriculture and an old generation, there's all kinds of things to look at. And we're involved in agricultural marketing and all the rest of it. And again, I want to say that what I'm going to find my comments to uh, 
today is really how can we finance the transfer of land? And as you've heard and you've seen from many people uh, who have presented to you, many people are <coughs> saying that it's time to bring back the old Land Development Corporation. And if I could just indulge you for a minute and uh, just review that. Back in 1968, great story Roy Atkinson tells you about how that came into being. But the Land Development Corporation was established as a bank, uh, a land bank. And th those were in the heady days of uh, the Comprehensive Development Plan. My longtime mentor, Dr. Maloney, told me that they used to sit around cabinet and discuss how they were going to spend all the money coming from Ottawa. That's a little bit different today. Uh, we have a lot. Of, but one of the areas that they felt was necessary is at the time, there were a whole bunch of small mixed firms, uh, older people running them, uh, really not making a lot of money with them. And uh, it was time. But what were they going to do, how were they going to get out, and how would a new generation get in. Now some of that happened within families, but in those situations where it didn't, people were able to sell their land directly to the Land Development Corporation, who then banked it. And then a new generation of farmers coming along, um, of course they were changing, unlike, unlike uh, their predecessors, they were going more to specialized agriculture, very modern, uh, and much larger than the farms had been. And the LDC allowed for that transition, and it went very smooth. And as one of your speakers said the other night, there would be very few farms in PEI that didn't take advantage of the Land Development Corporation. So, and I did have a student, actually, a few years ago, just at the time when they were destroying the records in the archive, too, to go in and do some work and to look at the LDC, and I can comment on that. But generally, the bottom line was it was a tremendous success and actually didn't cost the government that much, but that's quite debatable. Um, so at what happened then is that uh, most firms then were financed uh, with debt. In other words, uh, you went to your bank or the lending authority or whatever, you borrowed the money, you bought the land, and uh, regardless of what happens to commodity prices, the problem with debt is the bank wants an interest payment every month, regardless of whether it's a good year, bad year, or whatever. And uh, when we look at the research or the literature, um, I don't think this will come as a surprise to a lot of people, but land is almost always a profitable investment, particularly over a long period of time. However, it is almost always never a financially feasible investment, especially in agriculture. And the reasons for that is that margins are so low in agriculture, and when you do these net present value calculations, it's just like if you buy a house and you try to sell it in five years or whatever, you're out money because you really haven't been paying anything towards it. And that's similar for a farmer. So for the first seven or eight years, depending on the assumptions you use, um, it's not a financially feasible investment. And this is one of the barriers, especially with the high land prices now, that prevents farmers from going into it. The alternative way to finance farms is what we call or use equity funding or money from outside investors. Now, if land has been such a good investment, why haven't we had outside investors coming in to the land business? Well, uh, and in fact, a lot of people, that, that is changing very quickly. Land is becoming, or be, is attracting the attention of investors. And several of your speakers spoke of what they call land grabs, or uh, the term the academics are using it is the financialization of farmland. Or, um, as I say, and people are very concerned about that. and. Uh, I share that concern 
there's no question about it. Land, it, it hasn't hit PEI. But if I could just share a little anecdote with you. Um, I visited my old stomping ground in Ontario when I managed the Ontario Vegetable Grower Marketing Board, and I was down in Kent and Essex County. Just very quickly, uh, Mr. Commissioner, Kent and Essex County is class one land. So even when I was there in the 70s and 80s, it would have sold for about 3,000 an acre. And I did notice, one, it was one of the reasons that I wanted to visit, that the land values in Kent and Essex had gone for, let's say, into uh, the year 2000, had risen up to about 5,000 to 6,000 an acre, which is uh, pretty high. They're growing a lot of high-value commodities there, seed corn, processing tomatoes and that. And, uh, but in a very short period of time, from about 2005 to 2012, do you know what it is now, Commissioner? 14000 to $15,000 an acre for class one land. So I inquired as to what was driving this, and there's a lot of literature of this right across, but it was great to hear it firsthand. And one fellow I knew told me that he had a good size operation. I was surprised at how big the operations had become. Like a big, I meant like they're about 1,200 acres. They don't have to rotate the land. The land is uh, as far as they're concerned, too expensive to rotate, and I don't see a lot of rotation. But um, he, had, he was approached by a person from Toronto, a chap who had, was very concerned with the stock market and pulled his $25 million out of the stock market and wanted to put it into agricultural land. And he approached this farmer and said, well, you know, uh, I'll offer you, and that, it worked out to be about 14,800 an acre or something he was offering him. Anyway, and he said, well, you know, the son and I are still, the son's still interested in farming, soy, soybeans are good, and corn is good, and you know, I think we'll just stick with it. And the investor said, no problem. How about this? I give you the 25 million, I take the land, and you and your son can farm it as long as you like. That's the financialization of farmland. And that is a real concern, and there's antidotes around PEI. So, you know, one opinion I'll give you on the Lands Protection Act is I think it's giving us a felt sense of security that the land is protected, when in fact it isn't protected as far as I'm concerned. And that's why I think we have to look at taxation and securities legislation and what have you. Now, this, it's ironic though, this same financialization, uh, Mr. Commissioner, is exactly what I'm going to propose today as a model for the Land Development Corporation. So just to be clear, sometimes when I'm speaking, I'm not always sure I'm clear. So what I'm saying is, is that financialization is very, is a real threat, but it's also an opportunity this is not something for us to be afraid of, uh, Mr. Commissioner, and I know you will share this. L securities legislation, like land legislation, is totally within our control as a province. You know, I know we've ignored it, and every province is trying to get the federal government to take it over, but as it stands now, we can set all the rules on this financialization. If we're concerned by it, so it comes down to, are we gonna be stand here and be warmed by the fire? Or are we going to take control of the fire and stoke it and control it ourselves? So if financialization is a threat, then I think it's something that we can address through securities legislation. But it's also a great opportunity to, uh, in terms of how we would finance a new land development corporation. So now in the absence of charts, and not trying to sound like a professor, I'm going to go through the components of this model, uh, Mr. Commissioner, and, uh, um, and, then we could, and then you can ask questions or discuss whatever. But basically what I'm suggesting is that a land trust, an income land trust be established. That land trust, 
would, uh, would be a partnership made up of a general partner and limited partners. Now the general partner, the role of the general partner, if there's such a thing as an owner, and it's not really, a, a, this income trust is really a stack of papers in a lawyer's office, and that essentially is the owner. But there has to be somebody to take the liability. So the general partner assumes all the liabilities associated with the land and the land use. And for just think of this for a moment, I'm proposing that the new land development corporation would be that general partner. Now the other partner of the partnership is the limited partners. The limited partners have, own, have bought into a blind pool. In other words, it's not like a partner or investor comes along and says, here's my money, I want to buy that piece of land. The, you put your money, you pay, let's say, $25 a unit, or <coughs> minimum purchase of 100 units, but that $25 goes into the writ. Then the people that are running it, the general partner and limited partner and the promoter, I'll come to them later, uh, they're basically buying land with that. But as an investor, you don't say, well, my money went in there and we bought that piece of land. It just basically goes into a blind pool. And then the uh, writ goes about purchasing land. Um, now, the limited partners, what they get in return, they have a preferred claim on the profits. See, this is all they brought, bought. They haven't really bought land. They bought uh, participation or right to share in the profits from that land and the capital, any capital gains that accrue to that land. And so the limited partners are, uh, and we're doing research at UPEI just to determine what that rate of return would be, what the capital gains will be. We're uh, can sim now, we can access all kinds of data, use all kinds of assumptions. You get me more research money, Mr. Commissioner, I can run more assumptions and more scenarios. Well, uh, I think you know the <laughs> Treasury people better than I do. Well, well, Mahandra, my research assistant's working hard. I need to get another guy, so. Anyway, we, uh, <clears throat> so maybe, that's maybe, maybe you can get a raise in the question. So now please. we've got the money, now, now we've got the money in the writ's been established. One of the reasons that equity funding hasn't gone into agriculture is that there's no investor is going to go through the task of due diligence. Is this farm or any good? Is this farm, you know, and are the operations right? So it's impractical for them to be doing due diligence. See, also, the reason, another reason investors won't buy into some agricultural things is that buying into one farm is a is a risky venture. So who is going to be running these farms? Well, we enter a new element in Dialin agriculture, and I call it the farm management company. Now, the farm management company, I guess the best way to describe them is they're a relationship manager. They've signed a contract with the partnership. They've signed a contract with the general partner and the limited partner to manage this land on behalf of the partners to assume, to, you know, to make a profit. Now they're going to be looking for 10 to 15 percent of the gross farm income from all these farms. That's just a quick, quick survey I did of North, North America, but that looks like what they would take out. But they manage the relationship between the owners of the land and the people that are actually going to be farming the land. The other thing that the manager does is that they go out and they contract with agricultural entrepreneurs, and I'll talk about them later. But I just want to talk about this a little bit, a little bit about the farm management company. Do you remember, Mr. Commissioner, many people talking about the regulatory burden of environmental plans, health and safety issues, so on and so forth? Farm manager would be taking care of all that, right? Remember, the general partner has a liability for all that stuff, but the general partner hires a farm management company to do that, right? And they would report on land leasing. Actually, I have a lot of visions of this. I've talked to this. Um, 
it may come as a surprise to many, but maybe not. The traditional role of agricultural departments, right? Remember back when uh, um, Alvin Keenan uh, Sr. and George Lawton and Eric Robinson and them were farming? Who was their source of information, right? It was the federal potato inspector. After the federal potato inspectors and the development plan come in, we had a PEI Department of Agriculture, right? Well, I know when I was in there that one of its main functions was education and extension. In other words, it was out there in the community working with farmers. That traditional role has been abandoned not only by our Department of Agriculture, but most Department of Agriculture. They're really, uh, for the most part, they're delivering innovation programs and things like that, whatever agreements we have with the federal government. So that traditional role has been lost, right? So how are we gonna get a new generation in if there's no extension, nobody really to work with? And that's where these farm management companies and some other things that we're playing at UPEI would fulfill, or I could see that they could fulfill this function, okay? Um, now, the uh, people that actually farm the land, so the management company then, they're gonna be involved in a whole bunch of things. And what one of the ones that I've looked at, generally what they will do, it'll just depend on who they're dealing with. Let's say they're talking about um, a farmer that's a few years from retirement, but he's experienced and all the rest of it, but wanted to sell his farmland, but wants to continue farming. Well, they might go into another limited partnership with him, right? In other words, We'll, uh, you farm the land and we'll uh, share the profits or whatever on some other one. Other situations, they'll rent or lease, right? The agricultural entrepreneur, right, will rent or lease the land or what have you. And then, of course, there's wind farms and out west they talk about mineral rights and all kinds of ways to make income off farm. And anyway, farm management does that. They're professional managers, they're like, uh, uh, for example, like, it, this is coming to agriculture because it's happened in other industries, if I could just distract for a minute. If you look at uh, most shipping companies, most shopping malls, most hotels, you know, there was a time when Marriott Hotels actually owned the hotels. You couldn't get them to own a hotel now. That hotel is generally held in some kind of land trust. In other words, the ownership of the property is different. Marriott, Delta, all these people, they make their money from managing the properties. So there's wealth in both ends, one from the ownership of the property, the other from managing it. And that's uh, how uh, this would work. Now, agricultural entrepreneurs, why, that's a new term. I've stolen this term from the Hudson Institute. It's not, a farmer is, uh, if you think of a farmer traditionally, like, like if there's been one consistent change over the last 150 years in agriculture, it's the fact that agriculture has gone from being farms and farmers to businesses and entrepreneurs, you know? Farming is a business. There was a time when you could farm with very little money. Now you need a whole whack of more money. In other words, the more money that's been required to farm, the more it has become a business, right? And in fact, it's uh, a lot of people talk about that. The George Morris Center has all kinds of great information on that, but they uh, found, in fact, they went back and they redid income, farm income for the past 20 years. We could do the same thing here. We could get them to do it for us. And they recalculated and they take out one of the things that disport, disport, distorts farm income figures is you have a guy with five chickens and two cows. He gets thrown in with the uh, thousand acre operation and no wonder we can't, right? So anyway, they cleared all that out, really got it down to bona fide farmers, and they found that it didn't matter what size the farm was or what commodity they produced. Neither of those things could be used as a predictor 
of success or failure in farming. What they concluded, or what the popular hypothesis is now among academics, is that it turns out that farming is just like any other business. Whether it's success or failure depends on how well it's managed. And that's why I think these farm management companies are a big thing. And that's why agricultural entrepreneurs, and I've talked to lots of students of mine, some who are interested in farming, but most people feel that they can't even think of it. And when the Hudson Institute did a survey, excuse me for just a second, in the United mm -hmm. States, when they did a uh, survey in the United States, they found that the average entrepreneur invests approximately $50,000 getting into business. The average farmer invests 500000 to get started in the farming. Well, as long as it stays like that, right? Well, well, as I say to my students, the last thing I need you guys to do is go out of here, start another restaurant or bar in Charlottetown. Why don't some of you go into agriculture? Well, if they go into a, the restaurant or bar business, they don't buy anything. They lease the building, and especially like in bigger cities, I don't think you can in Charlottetown, but if you're in the restaurant business, you can even rent the tablecloths and the napkins and all the rest of it. And, that's, and so they make their money out of managing the business. Okay? Well, I'm saying that this same thing needs to come in agriculture. I was talking to a young lady and Actually, her boyfriend, her parents are, his parents are fairly big uh, uh, beef and potato farmers. Her parents are, have about 300 head of dairy cattle. Well, they're in business school, so they know that the chances of them purchasing these farms, it's just not even in the cards, right? And so when I explained to this, well, how would you like access to that farm? without having to purchase it. Fantastic. They said, you take care of the damn barn? And I said, yeah, of course, the farm management company would take care of well. Whether we get into those other assets or not is uh, something we can look at. But the point is that going into this business, if there's a lot less, then there's a, a better entry into the business. So I think that agricultural entrepreneurs um, you know, well, uh, well, in other words, it essentially says that you can go into farming if there's a management company and can get access to the land and uh, basically have an agricultural career without having to own things. Now, it doesn't say you can't own things or down in the future you will, but starting out, it's not going to be a good investment for you. Am I getting an out on something? And uh, we're just getting. We know you're ra wrapping up, Tim. So we're just so yeah. And I just wanted to point out. So the agricultural entrepreneur makes some money. There's some other people here that want some money too. There will be uh, agents who will sell these securities, like BMO and the banks and that. They want about five and a half percent. So let's say I was going to do a three thousand acre writ. Um, then I would say $10 million, so I would have to pay about $550,000 to have those sold, right? Also, there's a promoter, somebody that's promoting this whole thing, putting the deal together. They're going to be looking for about 2% of the net asset value on an annualized basis, and so on and so forth. But the point is, we've removed the requirement now for farmers to go into debt. They can get involved with a farm management company, depending on what stage they are in their development as a farmer. And it's also getting easier to transfer farms. The Hudson Institute talks about this. You know, there was a time when you were going into farming when you actually had to know how to plow a field, for example, or whatever. Well. Um, as one uh, older farmer explained to me, they had bought a new tractor. He jumped in the tractor, was stuck in the driveway, and he didn't even have a clue how to start it. 
But he says, he's, so he got the hard guy to do it. But when he got it started and all the rest of it, when you go out into the field, that thing is going to plow and it's not going to deviate one quarter of an inch off the drill. And it's going to keep it level and all the things. All the things a skilled plower had to do. Remember when they used to maintain the roads and they used to have those maintainers come? There used to be people that were good at that and people who were poor at it. Now you don't have to worry about it. A computer does it all. It was the same thing in agriculture. That's why agricultural productivity increases so rapidly. I think you represented an urban seat, didn't you? Yes, I do. Yeah, well, there's a big anyway. difference when you represent a rural seat. The point is, uh, so that's essentially the plan. Uh, and that uh, was the idea that uh, we're developing at UPEI. We're doing a lot of research because... Uh, and once we get this done, we're going to publish it. And, um, when and you... I've written uh, probably about a four-page or five-page document to give to you. Excellent. Which I will be sending to you on this particular point. So I just wanted to see if there were any questions. And after that, I'll go into my views on the Lands Protection Act, if you'd like. Well, I think what we're going to do. Um, sure. If you, um, anybody have any questions for Tim on what he, yes? I'd like to know this scenario that you're describing. Yes. How does that differ from the absentee landlords we had 150 years ago? Well, uh, the, the one thing is that I'm suggesting that the government or the Land Development Corporation be the general partner. And, um, yeah, so... They would, initially, I would see them being the, the people to start this. Down the road in the future, uh, once it became too big for them and they wanted to have more uh, others involved in it, then they would do it that way. But, yeah, because farmers don't own the land, is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Well, as long as it's owned and protected on PEI, by uh, something like the Land Development Corporation, and I think, and right now, that's one of my one of the reasons that I thought this was necessary to develop because right now, there's really nothing to stop all of our. You know, I just was there was a 300 acre farm east of Charlottetown that I knew a guy had been selling, for trying to sell for two or three years. He finally did sell it, and American bought it. Two weeks later, my friend Ronnie McKinley told me uh, in Buster Service Station, there was a big ad on the Bolton board in Buster Service Station. This American was looking to hire somebody to run that farm and grow some soybeans for him. Now, is that the kind of economy one we want on Prince Edward Island? And I don't think that that is. Okay. Well, I think we're going to do. Um, any more questions for Tim? I think what we'll do is we're going to excuse you for now, Tim, sure. and then we're going to look a little bit of a couple of films here. They're very brief, and then we'll provide the opportunity for anybody else to make some comments, and then we know you're available, and we can hear your comments on the Land Protection Act a little later. Would that be all right, folks? Okay with you? Yeah. Uh, could I just uh, make one request? Uh, sure. I'm at the University of Prince Edward Island. If any of you have and I presented this idea before. I just wanted to make an invitation. If any of you have any comments, suggestions, ideas on this, uh, we would appreciate uh, your input as well. As I say, we'll be going ahead with it one way or the other to research it. And whether people want to pick up on it or not, not our, under our control. Thank okay. you. Th thanks very much, Tim. Appreciate that. Hey. And um, what we're going to look at now this is a flyover, and we've used this in the last uh, few sessions. It wasn't available for some of the earlier sessions, but what it does is going to show the non-resident ownership along the coastline in two areas, it's Eastern Kings and West Prince, right? And what you need to do is we'll be starting at the very east, flying over the coast, 
and every time you see a rosy red property, that means the land is owned by non-resident, whether it's a non-resident individual or a corporate it has to do with the mailing address for the property bills. So, and the, one of the um, two heaviest areas in the province for that are the two film clips you're going to see today. Patrick? Great. All right, so the first one we'll run with there. Can you hear me? Okay. It'll be Eastern PEI, and most people know this area, and you're running along with the far tip in the east and moving west. Uh, most people are well aware of this area and you'll notice uh, when you're getting through it you'll notice some larger parcels in this one and when we go up to the western side you'll see more subdivision activity more small parcels that have been divided for more of an urban or a cottage use notice as you're coming along it'll get a little denser this is a more of a, an open area here and you'll get a lot of non-resident properties along this this area and as you can see they own the property well up back past the road and everything and roughly half of the coastline in this area is uh, owned by non-residents get towards the end there and you'll start to come up on Greenwich and you'll notice there is actually a fairly large subdivision right in the park there on the property and it's one of the few in, in, in Canada. <clears throat> and that's it right there. You can see the non-resident parcels are right in there. This will go from north to south. And this is also very high, it's about 48%, but you'll notice it's a little more blotchy in areas. There's areas that are quite, quite, uh, they're still owned by, by mainly residents. Other thing you'll notice is they're, although they're urban style subdivisions and they look to be something that would fit in a city, uh, most of them are not connected in any way, so you'll have to go back up one road and back the other to get into them. <laughs> you want to stop it, do you? <laughs> what? You want to try to come up and explain the properties to us? <laughs> Would you like to see that last one again, folks? Would you like to see it again? Okay, we'll, we'll run the last one again. through subdivi subdivision and development statistics that the, the rate of development permits and the rate of subdivision of these lots has been way lower in the western part of Prince Edward Island as it is around Charlottetown and around Montague. 
So there's less subdivision activity happening here. It's more land just sitting. <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, there's a, there are not a lot of subdivisions on the on the other side, but that there there are some that would be about 30 and 20 years old. Uh, but there's not a lot of subdiv subdivision activity. There's hardly any development permit activity, and uh, and the non-residency is lower, quite a bit lower than you'd see on that side. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, and. Um, I know some of you and some of you I don't know, and so when you speak, it just is helpful if you indicate your name. One of the things that's been a little surprising about these hearings is that we haven't had very much discussion about what we just looked at, the non-resident ownership amount of land. It has centered more on land limits, some on red tape, and so forth. But there hasn't been a lot of discussion about the level of non-resident ownership as, we, as I've traveled the province. Now, the meeting, to a large extent, is me to hear from you. And so, um, immaterial what Tim said, Tim Carroll, or what you've just seen here, um, and I know one or two of you may have to leave on the early side. What would you um, like to tell me? Father. Would you like to sit? Would you like to sit? Sit. J'apprécie l'opportunité de pouvoir parler en français dans une province majoritairement anglophone. We're um, just going to take a moment. And uh, yes, yes, Bernard, so if anyone else would like a, a recording, they can get it from you, correct? They can listen to it. Bertha, you take one. Do you have any left? Yeah, I must have one here. Okay. Okay. Father, nice to have you. Merci. I will repeat that I appreciate the to be able to talk in my language maternal in this commission. C'est une province majoritairement anglophone. J'apprécie l'opportunité de pouvoir le faire en magasin. Mon nom, c'est euh, Edé Cormier. Euh, je vais parler aujourd'hui dans mon nom personnel. Je suis pas... Euh, je, je, je fais partie de plusieurs groupes, entre autres l'Église catholique. Et, euh, mais je vais quand même parler en mon nom personnel aujourd'hui. J'ai grandi sur une ferme euh, mixte dans le district de Saint-Philippe tout près d'ici. On avait de tout. On avait le, les vaches, des cochons, des, des poules, des brebis. On avait le, des patates, cinq, six apprends de patates. C'était la terre qui était là, était là pour nous faire vivre, pour, pour nous donner à nourrir la famille, une grande famille, donner à manger à notre famille. Ce qui restait, qu'on qu produisait, on le vendait pour les gens de la ville. <coughs> pour ceux et celles qui n'avaient pas de terre. Aujourd'hui, on veut de plus en plus de terre dans une île où la terre est limitée, et ce qui voudrait dire de moins en moins de fermiers. À mon avis, ce n'est pas le bon chemin à prendre. 
La raison que je suis ici cet après-midi, c'est que je veux faire le point que moi, comme citoyen, je veux avoir de la bonne nourriture. Et la terre produit de la bonne nourriture. Et la terre soit bien conservée pour les générations à venir. Alors, une bonne protection de la terre également. Les fermes industrielles, je n'y crois pas. Je ne pense pas que pour une île comme la nôtre, ce soit le chemin à, à prendre. Au niveau mondial, on sait qu'on se garoche pour acheter des terres comme investissement. La terre, ça doit être pour tout le monde qui en veut. Je pense que le gouvernement pourrait acheter des terres pour en faire une banque pour les jeunes qui veulent fermer et pour les fermiers organiques. Je supporte fortement les produits organiques qui assurent une, une, une meilleure santé pour la population. Sur la question de la rotation de la terre, c'est le minimum, c'est trois ans. Je ne crois pas que les fermiers ont besoin de plus de terre pour faire la rotation parce qu'on peut organiser pour échanger la terre avec euh, les autres euh, fermiers qui produisent quelque chose de différent, spécialement les patates. Pour plus de 200, 250 ans, les Acadiens ont dépendu de la terre pour survivre, pour faire leur vie. Et je pense qu'aujourd'hui, on voit que notre, notre île est de plus en plus, moins en moins de personnes ont de terre, et ce n'est pas nécessairement une bonne chose. J'ai beaucoup d'admiration pour les fermiers d'aujourd'hui qui continuent de produire de la nourriture, alors que financièrement, c'est plutôt les compagnies d'engrais, des, tra des tracteurs, des distributeurs de nourriture eh, qui en profitent. J'ai une question pour euh, l'information personnelle sur la carte des corporations. Je vois que 33 un tiers de la terre de l'île est, est dans les mains des corporations. Est-ce que les fermiers euh, peuvent euh, former des corporations dans leur famille? Est-ce que, est que quelqu'un peut me répondre ça? Oui. Yes. C'est possible? Yes. Okay. Absolutely, Father. Alors, en fait, les fermiers qui le veulent peuvent avoir jusqu'à 3 000 heures de, 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 de terre. C est, c est Pro provided, provided that they have three equal shareholders, okay. either their family or their friends. Merci pour votre attention. Okay, no, thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate that. Somebody else would like to make some comments pertaining to the Lands Protection Act? Sure, Tim. <laughs> no, just on the Lands Protection Act. Sure, I, uh, sure. On that question. Well, we'll, uh, while you're expressing your opinion, I'll encourage others to formulate theirs. Okay. I, I just, uh, I guess I, I don't see any, uh, it was very educational for me to attend the last couple of meetings when the Federation and the Potato Board and that. And when you listen to what they're saying carefully, it's, it doesn't seem to be that the land limits per se are the big problem. It's, uh, I think it's the idea that we paint it up with a broad brush. In other words, now it's 1,000 and 3,000 acres. We change it to 1,500 and 4,500. It's going to be a only a matter of time be when that becomes a problem. The, the idea being that the broad brush never works, especially this, and as a lawyer, you'd be much more familiar with the complications than I am. These intergenerational transfers can get, you know, there's, uh, I don't think any land limit that's really going to resolve all potential problems there. And I think there really has to be, like when I hear it, there just has to be more flexibility. And on the issue that I do have a little bit of knowledge in terms of economies of scale, 
The reason you haven't heard any particular evidence on economies of scale is that you can't, uh, it, it, it's the same way. It's one of those tools in business that doesn't apply as an industry standard. Everybody thinks that mistakenly that economy scale is a solution in every situation, particularly in agriculture, and it's not. Agriculture is much too diverse. It's, uh, and it's the same with any other business. Sometimes economies of scale is the issue and has to be addressed. Sometimes it's economies of scope, diversity in the business. Sometimes it's vertical integration, sometimes it's backward integration, so on and so forth. So I don't really think that economies of scale is a, a really good argument for increasing the land limits. From what I've heard, it seems that Everybody just wants to reduce the red tape and keep the act and just make it a little bit easier to work with. I don't see why in PEI we couldn't do something like that. Okay, so just don't sit down now. You okay. <laughs> in regards to uh, economies of scale, either from your knowledge or from your work that you're doing at the university, are you able to give us any evidence or any indication that um, bigger is better and more profitable as opposed to small? Well, I'll tell you what you do. If you could give me a particular firm and give me their books and stuff like that and record of operations, we could do an analysis and tell you if there's an economies of scale issue. And that's really what it comes down to. There's ways to analyze this, but to give you broad evidence to say that economies of scale is always the answer, no. No such thing exists, as far as I know. Okay. Now, there is that George Morris information, which doesn't really come at it directly, but they did indicate, like if some people say to you that, you know, if the farm was bigger, I would survive, well, that really doesn't hold up to evidence. It's usually not the size or the commodity that you're involved with that is the problem. It's usually another problem. Anyone like to ask Tim a question or make a comment in relation to what he has just said? I guess you're back to your chair for now, Tim. Thank you. Okay. Other p individuals' comments? Peter, you must have a comment. Later. Later. Okay. I have to pick up some information from these other fine folks, sir. All right. Okay, we, this gentleman is coming forward. Yes? Yes, my name is Ray Arsenal. Yes, right. Where do you live? I live in St. Nicholas, <clears throat> not too far away from here. I've been listening to uh, the conversations here that have been taking place, and uh, <clears throat> in relation to Mr. Carroll's comments, uh, like, there's nothing in there for family farm that I hear, you know, keeping the family farm in that context that we are all familiar with, you know. And so I, I you know, I have a lot of questions for him actually, but I know it's not the forum for it right now, but uh, in, that, in that regard, plus in other, I'd like to get some understanding what he talks about with securities and all that also. But anyway, um, I also want to make a point to what um, Father um, Eddie had said about uh, you know, and he fully supports organic farming, and uh, but then he talks about rotation and then how we can get involved with potato farmers in rotation. Well, if you're, we went through this organic farming thing uh, starting in 2006 because uh, of ADLs uh, uh, asking us to, uh, if anyone was interested in doing organic farming for and producing organic milk, so we uh, we went into that. Uh, um, into that uh, line for a while, and uh, we had to uh, spend a lot of money in trying to uh, uh, make ourselves self-sufficient in land, and we had to get specialized equipment and such, because we can't, you can't just get into a rotation with a potato farmer if you're going organic, because you can't use their land, they can't use yours, you know, because they're using pesticides and fertilizers and stuff, and you just can't use it, so it's, uh, you know, it, ca it caused a bit of a problem. And then when we did get uh, certified, uh, ADL produced about 33 tons of cheese, organic cheese, and they couldn't sell it. This was in 2008, 2009 when we had a 
downswing in the economy. They couldn't sell it. So they quit. They have, you know, I was sitting on the board at the time, and the right decision was don't buy it, don't make it if you can't sell it, right? And so what, it left us in a bit of a lurch. And uh, you know, we had spent a lot of money and such uh, to try and get into, you know, to keep, the, you know, keep this going, because my brother especially bought into the philosophy more than I did. I looked at it from the economic point of view, and uh, economically, from uh, you know, here on Prince Edward Island, uh, organic farming on a large scale, in my opinion, is, is not viable. I, and, I, and we've been, you know, we've had to do other things just trying to bring ourselves out of it. And so, <clears throat> uh, when you look at, you know, and then you look at the, your land, and I mean, it's a good use of the land. I mean, as far as 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 far as that's possible, you know, as far as that's concerned. But to do it on a on a large large scale, you know, you have a, it's, you know. You know, it's it's more of a niche market, a smaller market, uh, and uh, so that's what a comment I wanted to make about that. And also, one of the concerns I have also is uh, as as farmers are getting older and uh, and less and less, uh, we're down to 192 uh, dairy farmers in Prince Edward Island. You know, you go back 25 years ago, and there was, you know, I don't know how many it was over thousand. I was say it was I think it was a thousand or or better. So we've dropped a lot in the last few years. And, this, and the trend is continuing. And uh, what, what we're going to see is, you know, because of the hog industry almost di dead here and the uh, beef industry struggling, you know, you're seeing a lot of land in this area that are not, is not being farmed. It's growing up in bushes. And that concerns me. And, and you know, and I think there's got to be something in this, you know, something that the province has to look at. So, well, how, what are we going to do with that land? Are we just going to let it grow up? into you know, bushes? Are we going to do something with it? Is there some way that uh, we should be developing programs and we should be or looking at encouraging young people to take over this land in some, in some way? Maybe that maybe should be part of Mr. Carroll's, uh, what he looks at, say, you know, here's land that's not being used. You know, what's the value of it? And what can we do with, them, with it to make it valuable or bring it back to production? So I guess those are, those are the comments that I would have to make right at the moment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The uh, matter of succession is um, complicated and it's becoming more troublesome all the time. It's one of the issues that is apparent now as we talk about the Lands Protection Act and it didn't seem to be at the forefront of any discussion 30 years ago when the statute was implemented. I think Tim makes a, a good point that there needs to be some discretion and flexibility in that area. There has to be. And um, life, uh, sorry, Tim. Yeah, if I could just talk about that, you know, I agree the family farm is dying, and that's sad to see. But, uh, you know, as Alvin Keenan told me once, there used to be an old joke around the farm that you would say to your kids, if you don't smarten up, I'll leave you the farm. And apparently most of them did uh, decide to smarten up and uh, got educated and left. And that's really what has killed. You know, I, in the course of our research, if I could just share it. Was, was that Alvin Sr.? Yeah, no, I was Alvin Jr. Oh, was it? Okay. Uh, but as they say, I, uh, I just wanted to share with you, Commissioner, which I think these bits and pieces come up from my research, but when we were looking at this intergenerational transfer in some of the papers I read from the United States and in Canada, did you know that they predict now that the new generation of farmers is more likely to come from an urban background than a rural background? And in fact, the rural ones seem to be less Right, and one of my students said, and they said, yeah, that's right, Tim, you're always talking about small business succession. It's the same with farms. Dad sent me out there picking rocks, and then when he went to the bank or the marketing board meet and I was left home, he said, I had no idea how to take over the farm, or you know what I mean? Like, there are things like that. The other thing is, in the United States, uh, it's incredible to see, but we see this other places of the world, it's very likely that these new farmers, many more of them will be women. 
than there have been in the past. In other words, not saying that more will be women, but there'll be more women going into farming than there is. And then the other source, uh, Mr. Commissioner, has uh, that's identified, and I think this has real potential for PEI because it really is part of our past too, is a lot of farmers come from immigration. People will immigrate to Canada to Right. And then when you talk to students in that from Asia about the idea that there is potential to actually get access to land and farm the land, this is a incredible. Uh, I did a course in agricultural marketing. I was only expecting 10 or 12 people in it. There were 32, and I had uh, nine countries represented in that class. So there's lots of interest. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Ray, I was just going to say earlier that um, in the last year or two, I've become aware and I had occasion when I was speaking with at the Young Farmers Association <clears throat> that uh, there's a young gentleman there in his mid-20s from Holland, and he took his undergraduate degree. His thesis was in, our, not here, in organic farming in Princeard Island and the family over in Holland sold their property because it was becoming uh, so close to an urban area and the municipality wanted it for green space. And so the family sold their assets and have moved to a community east of Charlottetown and they are now in the initial stages of taking the land to be certified and building buildings and organic and they are going to be a major organic farmer, probably one of the largest, I would think, in PI. But the situation was that they come, of course, with the knowledge already and significant capital. From probably sales for their... Well, and, and they well could have, and they well could have in that regard. I didn't have a chance <clears throat> to uh, look at today, but I, I did find interesting um, what Tim talked about women is that uh, there's a feature story in today's Guardian about the two women in organic farming. It goes on for an entire page plus. Okay. Anybody else would like to, to mention some comments? Just a couple of points. Uh. Peter, Peter Bulger, <laughs> who's, who's gone from the crutch to the cane and back to the crutch again, Foxley River. The other night in Charlottetown, there was quite a few comments about the utopia of organic farming and how we would be able to uh, completely eliminate the use of fertilizers, chemicals, and uh, also fossil fuels with the organic farming. Uh, those comments went unnoticed in Charlottetown, and uh, we have a rare resource here in the person of Ray Arsenal who has actually tried commercial farming organically. I was wondering if he feels as though the, the uh, actual greenhouse uh, footprint and use of fossil fuels was, fuels was much different in organic farming or maybe possibly even greater than conventional farming. Right. Yes. <laughs> it's just something that it's a whole policy to think there I think and I think Ray can that it's a policy. Yeah, thanks, Peter. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about you know, did we use less fuel? One thing, right? Well, I, I remember being at your place one day, you were using a very, very heavy cultivator to achieve what probably could have done with a a $10 an acre shot around <laughs> uh, Yeah. Now, there's no doubt we, we did end up using more fuel. You know, we had to make more passes, you know, uh, on our land, you know, either in the fall or in the spring. to try. And it's weed control is really what it was, basically. So, yes. But I'm, I'm, and what was your other point? Uh, well, it's just the point I want to make to the commissioner, that organic farming is not a fossil fuel utopia. <laughs> The, uh, one of the few people that, that has lived that. That's right, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, it's okay for somebody in town to, to say, you know, that, that we can do our organic farming and save all this fuel. And, uh, Some of the other individuals here, you haven't been at their meetings before, so there was a particular reason why on this little afternoon, with a few s snowflakes flying, that you decide to come, and you maybe wish to hear others, and you may not wish to speak, and that's fine, but this is a pretty casual, relaxed setting here, and you uh, have heard a few comments, and we've given you the sheet of paper, and so forth. Uh, just wondering what you had to say. Uh, because uh, if we can't get the conversation sort of rolling here a little bit, I'm going to um, pose some rather direct questions. Now, the back row there is pretty silent, you know, like I learned. Well, that's fine. What's your name? Allison Dennis. Allison Dennis. Can you, uh, the, you guys hear him? Can't hear him? You okay? All right. Uh, how would you like to come up and have a seat, Allison? <laughs> and that'll take you from the back row to the front row. <clears throat> yeah. Allison, where do you live? Early. Oh, yes. I've always been intrigued by that name. It seems like a, a lovely name. Apples, uh, Arlington Apples. You know, I was in England one time and I came across this little community, and the name was Arlington. I said to my wife, let's stop the car, and we just walked around. Is it named after the community in England or elsewhere? I'm not that old. I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I know you're not, but I just thought you, I thought you might know some of the history of it, eh? <laughs> yeah, I can tell you're pretty shy with the mic. <laughs> You got some paper there? You make uh, notes or? No, just passed them coming in the door. Oh, yeah. um, no, I, I, we just grow potatoes and grain and wheat, or barley and wheat. I guess that's what we. And who's the we? My, well, <clears throat> myself, my wife. My, I have uh, three girls as partnerships in the farm, and um, that's about the, that's the state. We have some hard hard people. Sure. But that's, that's basically what we, then we grow some, <coughs> we chop, <coughs> cut some hay and leave it for, and, uh, but all we, our, our big crop is potatoes, or was, we had uh, something happen to them this year, and we, we lost them, just about half of them, to, oh my. they just broke down and right after they come out of the ground and, um, I don't know whether we gassed them. We always gas them for April and uh, mostly June, July, and into August to ship them to a processor. But we moved them all in from the last few days of December till here. Uh, I guess we were done at the end of March, but they we threw a. There's ups and downs in farming, and uh, this year was a real lesson for us. We we lost uh, pretty near. Well, I'm, my secretary's working on the, how much how much our loss really was because we, but we had to haul them from a, one warehouse to another warehouse to wash them and then haul them back to the processor. Anyway, <clears throat> it's just it's just a bad dream. But we we had some good success farming, but this is really a. The worst? The worst I've ever encountered, yeah. yeah. And you support, you're involved with crop insurance, are you? Or? No. I got away for 20 years without crop insurance, so I, uh, it doesn't, uh, it costs a lot of money, and uh, I don't think I'm out anything. I, I lost half my crop, but I still would have had that spent in the last 20 years. I would have spent the same amount. Yes, absolutely. More money so <clears throat> and anyway, i'm not didn't go to government complain so i know where, i know where we fit you know i could i could have had crop insurance but you, you have to have it every year and you uh, we looked at it last spring but um 
We have to have, as far as any good, you have to have five to somewhere between five and ten years of good, good uh, crops to short where you can even get a penny out of it. So um, we, we found out what the other side was like this year. Sure. And uh, have you had any experience with the Lands Protection Act? My, I only got very grade eight in school. Now, what do you mean the Lands Protection Act? What do you? What do you yeah. but, but you don't have a, you don't have to report your land holdings to Iraq each year. You don't have oh, that. Yes. Oh, yes. You do have. Oh yes. Okay. Anyway, I just come to see what was going on, and I wanted to hear what was going on here. So yeah. that's what took me here. Well, I appreciate you coming. Thank you. Okay. Increasing it to fifteen hundred and forty-five. Well, I, uh, I'm, uh, I'd be in favor of it, but I mean that's I'm only one person, and there's, I don't I don't expect to. Um, most of the help that we have have no no desire to own a farm or have anything to do with it. They want me and uh, some of my family to take it over and. Um, and they uh, they want to, they want to work. We have up to in the fall of the year we have <clears throat> about 40 people work for us. And uh, and in the spring we have in the 20s and 12 to 15 all summer. But I mean they don't want to farm. They're um, they just want to come and get a paycheck. And so I don't know. How, you know it's a different group of people to what 20 years ago or 25 years ago I mean people uh, I don't think there's near as many people there's not near as many people that want a farm than it was 25 years ago but, but now how to, this limit is uh, uh, well I, I I don't expect it to, uh, to us to gain anything by it we'd like to have a little better rotation and and stuff like this, but we have we, we have a contract with the processor for so many potatoes every year, and that's basically our goal. And the rest of it is <coughs> to grow barley, wheat, and hay, and, and uh, the hay is cut and left, and the barley and the wheat we just simply grow two different varieties. For, it's easier to get. Um, well, you can <coughs> you don't want all your grains ready to cut in one one week, so. If you spread it out over a month, if you have different types of seed, so <clears throat> that's about the only reason why we do that. Just okay, uh, let, let me ask you a few specific questions. I guess I uh, misunderstood a little bit ago when you said you didn't have much application Lands Protection Act, but well, I forgot what you, I know. We we fill it out. Okay, so so there's you and your wife and your three daughters there involved in the farming operation with you. Yeah. And do they have husbands or? Yes. And, okay. And um, do you uh, lease much land in Allison? Oh uh, yeah, we lease some. We lease some to. Um, we lease some in, in and we lease some out. I guess some people get some. We have some farms that. Um, Want to trade land with us every year, every year. So that's part of our. our uh, uh, some people <coughs> want potato land. They want our potato land to grow grain, and uh, we want their hay land to, to grow potatoes. So, it, so um, is it one of your daughters that does the reporting to Iraq on your land holdings, or do you have a hired staff person to do that? Or? Yeah, we have a hired staff. To do okay. That. And I'm sure that that person has told you that when you make your report to Iraq every year, that you have to put in the land you own, the mm -hmm. land that you lease in, mm -hmm. but then if you lease any land out, you can't deduct that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, that's what they call double counting, mm -hmm. but I don't know why they call it double counting because it really could be triple counting. It could, doesn't have to stop and just double it. It's sort of like 
stopped in Tim Hortons there in Kensington on the way coming up with my friend and he just had a black coffee. That was pretty simple, but he could have asked for a triple. <laughs> you know, so it's not just double counting, it could be triple counting as well. So, so we've gotten a lot of, I'm getting a lot of comments about this double counting and triple counting stuff. And what, what do you think about that? Well, I don't know whether, uh, I don't know whether we're getting, we're putting in, um, I guess we're, we could be farming a few fields that we shouldn't be farming, but I mean, um, we have to live too, and uh, this here double edge stuff, uh, three different ways to go. Um, but where we live, um, there's people come looking for us to do something with their land and they don't want to put it in the down in their act and so they, we put it in their name and they sow the grain, we go back and cut the grain. That's, it's, um, it's not, I guess you're, <clears throat> it's not the way government wants to do, but we, we, we look at it as survival. And, I, you know, but I don't, you know, this thing started back in 1981, and uh, it hasn't changed since. Yeah, what did you, what'd you say about change? It hasn't changed since, well, I mean, it changed a little bit for acres, but um, the farming industry, when I, when I was, um, started out farming, um, we uh, had cows, and and uh, then uh, I didn't like that, so I, we shifted over to, I had a truck, say, we had a small farm, we had a truck, and then I, we got a job hauling milk, canned milk, and then little area around our area, and through Grand River, and through Lot 16 to Summerside, we had 66 stops. So, I mean, everything has changed, I guess I'm, I'm <clears throat> Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, so I mean, the whole, I, I, I would like to see the change, but I don't know how it's going to come, because I think, uh, I don't think the government's in favor of doing much to help agriculture. Well, I don't think I'm going to comment on that. <laughs> 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 anyway. And I just don't wait. You, you've been so willing to come from the back row to the front here, yeah. and, and the fellow sitting beside you, he pushed you there to stay longer. We'll hear from him in a little while. Yeah. He can have his turn. Oh, well, yeah, I'm telling you. And if he thinks I'm hard on you, not wait till I get him up there, eh? Um, are, Allison, are, are you incorporated? Yes. Okay. Um, have you uh, tried to. Uh, have you wanted to sell any of your land or make any changes that have required that you've had to get through what we call the de-identification process? Have you had any of those types of experiences? No, we'd like to sell the farm. We want to sell it all. Now, I was thinking more of um, just a, a lot or a couple acres or have you had any no. of those experiences? No, you don't want them in tall. They're just, like, I mean, if you, if, if you get a, we don't like to have sell lots because I know that, but but some people have, yeah. and they've had to do that. Uh, I think one of the I've been in this game of a lawyer for quite a while, and I think one of the real saddest parts <coughs> is watching the film here. I don't know the western part of the province, but the eastern part of the province up around that area. Sometimes my legal work will take me up around that area. Is if you hear the story from a son or a daughter of people who sold some of their shore frontage, how they wish they had it back. Okay. And then when you hear the amount of dollars that they got for it, and it's, they said, well, we give it back, but I guess at the time that they bought it, their family sold it in the 70s or whatever, that maybe those dollars were pretty impressive, but whatever they were, I think they were needed dollars. I don't think that people consciously wanted to, to sell it. And um, we heard um, from a woman, her name is Carol Carriger. She um, uh, came to Charlottetown two meetings and she was in Crapple the other night and lives in a beautiful area of Prince Edward Island called Cumberland. 
and uh, she said that every summer the Americans would come into the house, the farmhouse, where her father lived, they put the checkbook on the table and say, how much, Mr. Murphy? But he, he refused to sell. He never sold. Okay. Uh, anyway, I got you off topic. But uh, before you go now, before you go, um, if, the, if that um, double counting thing, like one of the things that has to happen with law is that a law needs to be respected. And if it's not respected, then you have a whole bunch of other issues. So if the double counting or triple counting thing was removed, would you find that helpful for your operation? Definitely. Okay. Now, um, and I don't know your farm community, but you know that already, but do you have mu much woodland? Do you have much environmentally sensitive? Do you have streams? Do you have do you have anything like that? Uh, we have a few small streams, but and we have quite a bit of woodland. Yeah. Okay. And um, a couple of years ago, the government put a regulation in place that you could apply up to 40%. So in your company, up to 40% you could get for forest land, provided there was another qualification on that, 80% uh, rule. and then streams and hedgerows and marshlands and all that type of stuff. And that was supposed to be very helpful. But the interesting thing is that only about 12,000 acres have been exempted. Uh, have you applied for that? Yeah. You have? Yeah. Well, you're one of the few. We tried. We, we, we applied for it. And we went back and forth and back and forth to, with this piece of paper and this piece of paper and what you got here and what you got there. Last one. Spring come, we started putting the crop in, and they're up in the shelf there somewhere. So, uh, <coughs> meaning, just somebody that's got the job of talking to, getting out all this information, I don't think they have to farm, you know? No, I think you're right. Huh? I think you're right. <laughs> you know, they just, time means nothing to those people. Okay, no, but I'm, I'm, I'm extremely interested in this. The reason why I'm extremely interested is that I've met very few people that have applied for the programs. Like when I spoke to the Federation of Agriculture at the end of January, there was, I asked how many people in the room were aware of the regulation or felt that they, I think the right, right question was, I asked how many people owned land that would qualify? And about 40 or 45 hands went up. Then I asked how many people had actually applied and half a dozen went up, okay? So West Sheridan was there that day. And I told Wes Sheridan, he had a regulation that wasn't working. Yeah. Okay. Just that simple. It wasn't working. But you have actually tried to make it, applied in various whatever, and you just got disgusted with the process. Is that right? Yep. Did you do that yourself, or did your hard person do it, or did you go and hire a member of my profession to help you? No, we had a person hired to do it, but it got just dragged on and dragged on. Was it a lawyer that did it? No. Was it was just one of your staff. An account. An account. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so now, what would, uh, so that seems to be a lot of paperwork and a lot of frustration. You have people coming and everything else. Uh, some people have suggested that what should be the case is that the only land that would count in your total would be land that is being utilized for agriculture, like arable land, mm -hmm. and that how that could happen is that when you fill out your forms that you know the amount of your acreage, and uh, let's say that you had uh, 2,500 acres, three equal shareholders, mm -hmm. but there was about, uh, about seven or 800 acres that wasn't fit to be used that if you were to put that down in the forum and sign it, certify it, would that be an easier process than well, going that's through? that's what we were working on, is trying to get clear of some of this land that doesn't produce anything, you know? Yeah. But it was just, um, just uh, the rigmarole was unreal. I don't know what, it's just, um, so we just get fed up. And yeah. No, I appreciate that. That's, that's been extremely helpful. Now, is there anything else at this time you'd like to tell me? No, I, 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 you wonder why an old like me is still farming, but anyway. How old are you? That's 
Can't tell you that. You can't tell me. <laughs> well, I think I think you can tell me, but you won't tell me. No, I, I had I had I had two grandsons that were supposed to be firemen. Yes. And uh, one fella moved to Grain Auger ten years, twenty years ago, and he just hooked on the power line. Oh my! Him. He he died. Yeah. So the other fellow that was supposed to be there, <clears throat> he stayed around for a year or two, and it looked he missed missed the other fellow. So then he he decided he went to work for another company and. He likes what he's doing. I'm still stuck for him. Well, um, <laughs> unless you've gone through that experience and our first son died as a baby, you never get over as long as you live. Never. And I appreciate you have been much more helpful and informative than, than you think you have. And um, you uh, have been a great sport. And I need to ask you one final question. What's the name of the guy sitting beside you? Eddie Clark. <laughs> oh, no, I know. I know Eddie Clark. I know Eddie Clark. <laughs> Nelson McKinnon. All right. Okay. All right, sir, you're next. Okay, I'll go next. The last one Nelson. Now, Eddie told me he was, Eddie told me he was leaving earlier. He was going to do some, but I don't know if that'll, <laughs> well, you know, Eddie, a number of people have found that. Found that. All right, Mr. McKinnon. Okay, I'm uh, Nelson McKinnon. I'm a dairy farmer in Grand River. Yes, and, uh, and it's a beautiful part of the province. It is. Rivers yes. and waters and I'm subdivision. Stay there. Yep. Uh, well, I want to comment on the Land Development Corporation. I was one of the beneficiaries of that in the 1980s. Okay, how a, old were you then? Oh, 20 some. <laughs> See I, see, I asked the wrong question the other fellow. I should have come in the back door, right? Yeah, yeah it, was a, it was a great program then, I thought. We, uh... Just let, let's, let's spend a little bit of time on that, okay? Um, so did you grow up in a farm? Yes. Okay. And so when it came time to get off on your own, what were the options and choices that you had, Nelson? Well, we just, uh, I stayed with my father on the farm. Yes. And we expanded, and this was one of the ways we... Expanded? Yes. Okay. Yeah, well, so were you the only son? I wasn't the only son, but I was the only son at the time that farmed. That there's, farmed. There's another one farming now, too. With you? Yes. Okay. And, uh, yeah, we probably used the LDC for two or 300 acres where they held it in trust, and we paid rent on it for a few years till we bought it. Right. So the, the way it would happen is that, did you in fact um, have your eye on a particular farm and then you went to the property owner and said, look, uh, would you be interested in selling the LDC and then I can lease it? Is that how it worked? No, or it, it wasn't. The LDC bought it first and the, then we rented it. And you it. had no involvement with that parcel. No. So the LDC bought it, then you leased from them with an option to purchase. That's right. Okay. And you exercised the option. Yes. Okay. Now, um, it was in its heyday when I first graduated from law school. I am, some of the people that are traveling the road, some of, I only have one or two with me, but there seems to be a group that enjoying this so much they're going to all these different meetings, but they've heard this before. I'm the first carver on this male side of the family since 1783 who's not a farmer. My people came here from Massachusetts after they were involved a minor military skirmish they lost. Everyone's been farmers down the line. I'm the oldest of five sons, now four sons. My dad's still alive at 94, poor health in the nursing home. None of us are farm. I'm the only one in PI. But this was starting to come to the heyday when I started to practice my law in the early 70s. And there are some people we're hearing a fair bit about the idea of having land banking or LDC2 or something like that. And I've already publicly stated, Nelson, that I am supportive of that concept. Mm -hmm. There are some people who are not supportive of the concept. And one of the criticisms they have, and you would be a clear illustration that tells these, would say these people are wrong, is that when you lease land, you are not as good a steward of the land as if you own the land. Okay. 
and that. What do you say to that criticism? Well, I don't. I wouldn't agree with that okay. because when we when we were leasing the land from the LDC, there was nobody else could buy that but us. Like we had exclusive rights to buy it. That's right. Yeah, red shirt. So light. You'd, you'd certainly look after it like it was your own. Yeah, I think. Yeah. And in the, excuse me. And I was just looking at one of these documents the other night. In the lease document, you have it set for five years. And you have the right to renew it for another five, right. and then that's stated right then and there what the actual purchase price is going to be. It's not something to negotiate later on. It was right there. That's right. And so you exercised it after the second five, did you, or, uh, or did I you go one now. further? No, it was no more than ten for sure. Yeah. And the price of land was going of up. course going up, so it was. Uh, it didn't take long to decide whether. So you'd, you'd like to see that again, right? Well, I think it'd be a, a great way, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And if you, if you're done on the LDC questions, uh, you mentioned succession planning. Yes. And uh, I had the opportunity to meet with a lady from Quebec, who was, she specializes in succession planning in Quebec, and she deals with mostly dairy farms. And she was telling me that for a, for a dairy farm to go to the next generation, you have to take 50 cents on the dollar to, to see the next generation be successful with this farm. Okay. Do you have um, lands that, like up around Grand River, they have some pretty nice subdivisions and cottages and all that type of stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, do you have any waterfront property? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know enough about your background, but some of these guys start to laugh. I don't know what that means. <laughs> it's it's uh, we did de we developed some uh, some shore frontage lots, which wasn't it wasn't farmable land. Right. For and, so. and okay, so you developed shore front lots that weren't farmable, and have you sold many of those? No. Or? No. Why? It, uh, we were either asking too much or there's not enough interest in that area yet. Okay. And um, I guess what I'm really getting at is LDC is one concept of land banking. Okay. There's another concept of land banking, which is that we, and I actually support this, we should be protecting their landscape vistas and viewscapes and along those lines and that maybe they're ought to try to um, see if it's possible it wouldn't be possible in every situation that maybe there would be a, some type of a trust established that could buy some development rights from you along the water or it might buy some outright ownership um, what do you think about stuff like that I, yeah, I think that would be a great idea, yeah. okay. like whether it would be affordable or not. Well, somewhere along the line, you know, like in some meetings, this is where I stand up, but um, I said this the other night and I'm not sure what meeting it was, is that if I listen to every single request that people are giving to me that they hope will get in the report, that will tell government what to do. And if we look upon government as Santa Claus, the Santa sleigh would never leave the North Pole. Right. Just wouldn't work. Maybe in the NFU has said that. It, it just wouldn't. And uh, if you sort of want to know how Horace Carver thinks, is find a used bookstore in Charlton or Summerside and ask them if they have the Angus McLean memoirs. That's a guy that really influenced my life tremendously. And the other person that influenced my life in the agricultural community was my good friend, Prouse Chapel. <coughs> and um, in many ways, ironic that those are the two people I wish I could talk to today. Um, but we ask government to do all of these things for us. And what government, if they're going to be that strong, as Angus would say, if we're going to have a government that can give us everything we want, and we have to have a government that's strong enough to take everything away from us. 
in taxation or a whole bunch of other different things. Mm -hmm. So I would love to see when it comes to vistas and development rights being acquired that maybe there be some mechanism whereby we have the opportunity to open our wallets and open our pocketbooks and put some of our monies into that type of situation. Now I wasn't born when the war was on, but at that time Canadians bought victory bonds. And they bought victory bonds because they wanted their government to have money to fight the Nazis. Okay? And I'm just suggesting that maybe there needs to be some type of a program put in place where ordinary islanders can give money to be lent, you know, be getting interest, and development rights and vistas and different things can be acquired. And the net result will be they're saved in perpetuity, and the people, the farmers who own them, are going to end up with some cash, and you don't have to subdivide your property and have a whole bunch of cod just sprinkled on the shore. That's mm -hmm. what I'm suggesting. Yeah. And you think that's okay? I think that's a great idea. Should have had you up here at the very first meeting. <laughs> now, what else are you going to tell me, well, Nelson? Economies of scale. Yes. Uh, we like uh, we we milk about eighty cows year round, and that's at, like we milked eighty probably close to twenty years ago, and that was one of the largest dairy farms on the island twenty years ago, and now it's just a a little bit above average, maybe, and uh, it's. Uh... Thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Father. The two Eddies are leaving the room. <laughs> anyway, the like. I think economies of scale. It, it seems that for dairy farm, I think uh, you need to be a certain size. And now, are are you that size now? I think we are about the bottom of the size. The bottom of that size? Yes. Okay, so now you're going to tell me you want the land limits? Well, no, I'm just, I'm just telling you my, my opinion. Sure, uh, that's what I want. Our farm has been fairly successful, like, like dairy farm is pretty successful, we we'll get supply management, we made money every year, we never have a bad year, and we never have, you never make a fortune, but you always make a good living. And I can see where it's slowly eroding away because if you could expand a little bit, it would be much better. Even our processor has purchased a, another processor over, well, like it's a working relationship with a, a one in New Brunswick. Yes. And just because of the economies of scale, they do a lot of things back and forth together. And. Uh, I think even here they're starting to discuss where dairy farms are, like we, if we wanted to expand, like if I wanted to buy Peter's dairy farm and move my, he's quoted to my place, it's a, you can't do that. Like you, you might be able to expand by a cow or two a year or five or something. Out, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I know there's a lot of dairy farms in, in, the, in our area that are, not in very good financial shape, maybe, because not necessarily because they can't expand, but okay. I think that's part of it. Like, I have four tractors, Peter has four tractors, Jill has four tractors, everybody has four tractors that are sitting 95% of the time. That's why I think economies of scale can work. Okay, um, you're going to have to help me here. You're making these statements and what do you want to see happen or change? Obviously, you're well, not content. Well, I'm kind of getting to Allison. Like, I think a potato farm needs to have a lot of, a lot of acres for the crop rotation that the government wants now. And uh, what year was it that the 3,000 limit came in? Was it 1982. 82. So it's probably time it was looked at for change, I would say, because you're going to get, you, there's even dairy farms that are, must be getting up 
close to that now? Well, we haven't had many, much disclosure about the fact that these meetings. Um, do you grow potatoes? No. Just strictly dairy? Yes. We rent, we rent some land out to Allison. That's the connection. Okay. Uh, do you uh, own enough land that you have to report to Iraq every year? No. no. We have enough land, but I know there's a lot of people that... So you're, you're okay with sufficient land that you have? I am, yes. Okay, well but then... I, I would, down the road, I can see my son, it, like, our dairy farm will have to grow if, if he wants to stay around. And how old is he? 21. 21? Yeah. Okay. So uh, next year I'll have two at agricultural college. Like if, I'm not saying they're going to come back to farm, but if they ever did, like, it's, I'm way too young to retire, so... Uh, we'd have to expand to make a living. <laughs> Aaron Clinton's got nothing on you guys. <laughs> um, well, you know, through, through the midst of your comments and, and stories and mine as well, it's it's rather encouraging to hear of someone who wanted to be a farmer young, work with his dad. He had a brother who didn't want to be a farmer. That brother has come back. Now he's farming. And next year you're going to have two in agricultural college. You're not sure what they're going to do with the fact that they're there, there. Like, I mean, from my years, Nelson, those are wonderful stories. They're actually encouragements that. I don't hear that often as I travel these roads. Uh, I think highly commended. I might go a step farther and say that you know I take some notes and this guy takes all the notes and everything like this. But that we had a blueberry grower and processor in Eastern Kings wants to see the limits higher, and we've had um, a lot of potato farmers do, but then you would fit into a category of maybe just one or two, and they are dairy farmers that are saying you'd like to see the limits raised in part because your neighbors who are potato farmers, you think they needed it. Am I hearing that correctly from you? Well, I'm also thinking of myself. Because well, okay. like our farm is going to need to grow. Later on. Yes. Okay. And are you incorporated? Yes. Okay, um, let's go back to the questions I asked your seatmate there. Um, what do you think about if it was just arable land that was being counted? Would that have helped you? It would help, yeah. Okay. How much of your, how many acres do you have? Oh, we might have a thousand, probably okay. 650 to 700 would be farmable. Okay, so if you did that, that, that like that's a significant, that's a, a third, that's a significant difference? Yeah. Okay. But hey. we're, we're incorporated, like we can still go to 3,000. Yes, you can. Yeah. It provides you have three equal shareholders. Yeah. And you haven't had reason to uh, apply for the uh, environmentally sensitive exemptions, uh, I suppose, after you talk to your neighbor, Alice. No, you, you we did. We did, uh, we do have some land that's tied up in Alice. Okay. And what do you think of that program? It's, it's all right. Pardon me? It's all right. That means it's not all right. No, it's, it's good. <laughs> it's, it's better than nothing. <laughs> wow, heavens above. You know, Cal, <laughs> I used to run the roads here about 30 years ago up around this, 35 years <laughs> up around, but you know, I haven't been here for a long time, I'm telling you. I have to come up here more often. You should. <laughs> well, I've, this is my second trip to Wellington in a short period of time. And we were in Alberton, then in O'Leary, Kensington, Summerside. I told the mayor of Summerside yesterday I didn't know what was going on. I saw him in Charlottetown, which was a big shock. And uh, how come he didn't come to my meeting? Anyway, he 
said he was out of town when it happened. He didn't know anything about it at the time. Okay, what else are you going to tell me, Nelson? Well, Allison was telling you that he would, he'd like to sell his farm. Yes. Is there, is there some way where he could do that? To? Well, to government, investors. Well, we heard uh, Professor Carroll give a proposal there this afternoon. Yes. And uh, <laughs> you guys may wish to give him your names in case he gets that off the ground. <laughs> well, from what I can see, there are increasingly comments being made what you've just said. And uh, I would think if people expect government to have a situation where they're going to buy a whole bunch of operations completely and then turn around and lease them to people, I would think that that would be, might be a rather long, ex long wait for that to happen. The, um, program of the LBC that happened in the 70s, as I recall, had a lot to do with buying vacant land and that the people who lived on the property usually retained the ownership of the house and a couple yeah. of acres of land themselves. And uh, I think that is, Nelson, quite a <coughs> distinction between that particular program and suggesting that Allison's entire farming operation might be sold. Um, it gets back to my comment that if you expect government to be able to do everything you want, then first of all, they have to be able to take everything from you as well. Yeah, but, that's uh, fair. Yeah. And, um, Anything else you want to tell me? No, that's it, and thank you for your time. No, no, not either. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Now, there are a couple of other people over here that I haven't heard from at all. And, yeah? Just one Yes. The program that you offered in the 80s, was that to island residents only? On the LDC? Yes. Well, it's funny. And your name? Marlene Hall. Yes. Yes, hi. <laughs> I didn't expect to see you here today. I know. I'm just starting to get nosy with this concert. So. Are you? Yeah. Well, we had Della Parker at the Charlton Hotel the other night. Marlene, and she was in the back row. And uh, I picked her up to fill in a gap. And she sent me an email next morning telling me that she felt hyped about the meeting. Yeah. Okay, I guess I was successful with Ms. Parker. Um, I don't know the exact answer to your question, Marlene, except to say this, that quite a few years ago, and this would be about 25 years ago, I was representing an island farmer who applied, who submitted a tender for property through the LDC. And the highest tender went to a non-resident of, um, of Prince Edward Island. I forget if it was an American or Canadian. Something tells me it was American, okay? And I did everything in my power to make presentations and submissions and everything else to convince LDC at the time that there really wasn't any choice in the matter. There was some difference dollar-wise, but here I represented a family corporation composed of young farmers who would be at that time about 35 or 40, and they wanted to farm it. They already had a proven record in the community, and here was someone from away who wasn't going to be personally involved in the farming, and they were non-residents, okay? And I want to tell you, it was about one of the hardest things I ever did, but it made it ha we made it happen. So to answer your question, I don't know because I 
haven't looked at that particular program at that time, what it was like, but the fact that I was able to make it happen at the instance tells me that it probably was open to non-residents because otherwise they would have tossed their tender out completely as being unacceptable, okay? Uh, Merlene Wolf is a well-respected real estate agent uh, who I didn't expect to see in Wellington. Thank you. Um, some of you guys over here. Sir. Yes, my name is Amand Arsenault, and yes. uh, I'm not a farmer. Um, I own 0.5 acres of land my house sits on. My so. wife owns 0.5 acres of <laughs> land. I own no land. <laughs> and that's in Union Corner, just outside of Wellington here. Um, I've certainly been reading the reports uh, on the papers about the, your visits and your, your meetings, and I think it's very important to have this discussion. We appreciate the opportunity. And I know listening to the debate today, the pros and cons, and there's certainly different opinions out there based on the reports that we need more land ownership or we need to increase the acreage or lessen the acreage. But being an island here, land has always been very important and the core to our existence that we were very much attached to it. My father was a lobster fisherman, so but it's part of our landscape, it's part of our culture. and. Uh, and, and with today's economy, and we were talking, or uh, uh, Tim Carroll's presentation on the way or the type of things that could happen with economies of scale, et cetera, and in today's world, to make a living, a farmer, um, it, they, they have to move on with the times, that's, that's, that's for sure. So if they need more acreage, I think most people, and this is where I sit right now, is I think most people on Prince Edward Island would appreciate the fact that any farmer needs more acreage as long as they have uh, control and as long as we can protect the family aspect of farming on PEI and to sustain and, and make sure the land can grow good food, good sustainable food. And I think most people would, would, would accept that or appreciate that because it, it, it uh, we, we do have to retain our, our family farm in some way on PEI because being an island, we, we won't go into other resource sector industries like mining or, or, or forestry. It, 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 it won't happen on, on a large scale. So farming is very much part of our culture and it should remain that way. Being an island, we have such an opportunity to grow good food. And I think one of the biggest dangers of protecting our land it's not a farmer having more acreage, is the quality of that land to grow good food. And uh, maybe, and I'm just gonna throw this in, but a few years back, we had an opportunity to have this island uh, labeled as GMO free, genetically modified foods. That's an, for another debate. We missed an opportunity there, in my opinion. The world, would, markets would have opened up to us with all the debate around genetically modified foods. However, I think um, if there's this whole um, issue of land protection, if, if acreage is increased for farmers, which I don't disapprove, it has to be done that it protects the family farm, it protects corporate control of what we find is, is important to, to Prince Edward Island, to Islanders, and to our, to our land and to the quality of our land. And I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to, for here. Well, I, pre I appreciate those comments very much, uh, and, and the, I should have said this earlier, I uh, had some calling cards printed up, and uh, there's my email address and everything else like that, and so after we saw this meeting, don't hesitate to, um, to send me comments and so forth. The gentleman right here, Bay Ray, are you going to say anything? Right Would you like to say something? You. Okay, because um, I think I've picked on everybody else. I have yes, Marlene. Um, when a non-island resident owns a property, yes, and then an island resident purchases that property, yes, the non-development clause stays with the property. Mm -hmm. Why and how is that fair to the new owner? It's an island. For example, it was just a, a, a mini farm, a 32-acre mini farm that I recently sold, and 
that was the exact situation. And the new owners wanted to put a, a, a riding arena. I mean, they're not going to make a killing at it, right? They're just boarding a few horses. And they were told flatly, no. Who told them flatly? When they went into um, Iraq. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, yes? Sure, right? I'm writing a piece of property from a lady that's a farming 40 acres. She lives in Connecticut. But uh, she, uh, we Can she you know, speak a little louder? Yeah, I'm <coughs> renting this property from a lady and she's 40 she acres. Lives in 40 she lives in years. Connecticut, yes. And, uh, but I, I was able to fill out a form for her so she could get this land, uh, she could get reduce taxation on it. Mm -hmm. Now, does that apply to the same thing as what she's talking about? You know, like if I was to buy that land, let's say that land came available to me. If I was to buy that, you know, what, you know, what you're talking about is... It's a 10-year restriction that IRF puts on property to non-island residents. So that an island resident comes along and purchases, that non-developmental clause sticks with the land. And that, I don't believe, in my opinion, is fair to the new owner. Because then they can't go and do what they want with it. They don't have the same freedom that they would have had if they purchased that land from the other restaurants. All right. Margaret has a short and sweet comment, which I'm going to keep her to her short, sweet comment because of your voice. I'm not going to talk about wind farms or anything else. Um, I think you and um, Tim need to get out and travel the country more, especially Tim, and get his hands dirty in some of the barnyards where I happen to come and visit because the two large farmers, and one of them presented to you at the last meeting, are growing their farms with their families. And what they're doing is the kids are going to college in one case, they're quite a large farm. And for summer jobs, they're coming back, they're walking the potato fields and doing the things that need to be done in the fields. And that's bringing in the, the children with an education into the farm. The other farm, the kids from Yay High are in their arms. I walked in the barnyard one day to talk to the farmer, and it's a family farm. The farm was inherited from, or passed on from the father down to the three children are involved, two are girls. And one of those daughters was walking around introducing the new baby who would be about a week old to all the staff and the burns and everything. Those farmers are not going to be gone. They're going to go on, and the family members are going to come in to the thing. And I think need to take a look at what is actually going on in the farms instead of sitting in offices is my suggestion. Because I think the farms are going to stay in the families. And I sort of agree that you do need an increase from what I'm seeing in my area in the amounts of land. Anyway, that's short and sweet. terms of reference number four any other matter which the commissioner deems appropriate to review and bring to the attention of executive council uh, that's pretty wide sweeping so. in your estimation does that involve the uh, confrontation or any issues yes, related to confrontation or uh, land stewardship yes uh, as the round of meetings closes i would uh, I would like to state that I am not opposed to the idea of increasing the land limits. In fact, I see it as probably a necessity as we go into the future. And like I know the two families, so, so the lady who spoke was talking about them, and Allison uh, and Nelson, successful farms that uh, will have to grow as, as the generations go on. Hopefully, that's what will happen. Uh, we have this issue that's been talked about a number of meetings about the 25% or so who aren't uh, maybe uh, practicing the best stewardship. Uh, with all the respect to Mr. Lickletter, who presented the other night, a highly respected gentleman in the farm community and the business community in general, uh, referred to them as maybe, maybe speeders on the highway where somebody else uh, referred them to 25% as uh, Impaired drivers, maybe. Uh, 
because I tend to look at the RNs and pair drivers. Uh, they can do a lot of damage in a, a generation or so. <coughs> Excuse me. That's poor stewardship. Uh, it's going to take a long time to bring some of those uh, parts of the land back. And I wonder if this isn't the, uh, the point in history where there's an opportunity for uh, all that situation to be addressed. Uh, and I don't mean to harass everybody who's doing a good job, but there, there are some people who, uh, one or two, uh, it's not even close to being doing a good job. <coughs> I refer to the uh, the crop rotation scenario where we're using ryegrass and uh, potatoes perpetually, put biphosphate on the round on the uh, on ryegrass in the fall, plow in the fall, land is red ten winters out of ten. Uh, I don't think there's any excuse for that kind of stewardship in this province, and, and this is not the time to. Uh, Maybe address that. Um, the meeting's from scheduled today from two to four thirty, and there was early part of the meeting there when I was starting to say if Tim didn't carry on with his comments, we mightn't have anybody else speak. But I've changed that opinion long ago, and um, I uh, I know there's several people like Berth and Karen have faithfully attended these meetings. And they may wish to make some comments. But uh, I'm going to stay here until the cows come home. And if you want to talk to me afterwards a little bit privately, fine. But in the last five or 10 minutes, you've just been pumping comments every which way. And somewhere along the line, I feel I need to say a, a few things um, to answer. And, and Marlene, some of the comments that you're making are really so direct um, towards uh, number two here um, about the, um, I don't think you may, uh, Natalie, I'd like another one of these sheets of paper up here, please, uh, to appear to Marlene get in here without you giving it to her. Um, to right there. Is that this land identification program has been causing a significant amount of issues and discussion in these public meetings? Okay. And just to take a very brief snapshot, is that any time that you get land, uh, Nelson, if you were to get land from the provincial government, then it's automatically identified for agricultural purposes, non-development. If you were a corporation, you flip it from yourself to your corporation. All of your lands are identified. Okay? If you are a non-resident of Prince Town and you get a permission to buy land, unless you are located the lands inside a municipality, they're all identified. Okay. Now, um, if you have those identifications on it, everybody thinks, almost everybody thinks, that after 10 years they're over. That is not the way it is. Okay, is you have to wait until the first year goes by and then you can give 10-year notice. And if you don't give the 10-year notice, you still have to wait 10 years until you give the notice. Now, I have uh, sent a letter to Iraq and they have responded. And like I asked them some questions that I know the answers to, but I'd like them to tell me. And one of the questions I asked them is about the identification program. And they responded and said that the most commonplace thing they hear about the identification program is everyone thinks it's over after 10 years. Okay. Well, you know, there's something wrong with the program if all the people that are in it think that it's over after 10 years. Okay. Like there's something wrong. And who's the wrong with? Well, can I say I think it's with the people that have put the program in place or the people who are administering the program? And I can tell you, because I know the case is to be true, and I've had people contact me, not because of this job, 
because I've been around with a bit of gray hair, some other lawyers have contacted me and said, we have some instances where people have obtained building permits and have built homes and yet the land is found to be identified and that when they go to sell their home down the road, they can't get permission to sell it because it's never been de-identified years ago. Okay? And now when you fill out an application form for subdivision is that the government has put right in the middle of the documents, only gone in, in the last number of months, certainly no more than six months, right in the dent that is the obligation of the applicant to make sure that the lands are no longer uh, subject to identification and that you have to call IRAC to make that happen. Well, the only reason those words are put in the middle of that document is to take to pass the buck and to take it away from the planning division and put it on the hands of the individual, okay? And I don't know why the media doesn't come to all these events. They have missed so many wonderful stories. It's unbelievable the stories they've missed. Folks, that's going to be addressed in my report, okay? Whether <laughs> government does anything about that, I don't know, okay? And to answer your specific question, Marlene, you have a non-resident that has land, there are identification restrictions on it, they sell it to an island resident, okay? Well, first of all, you have to know the facts. Was it how many years ago has identification, notification been given and all those things? Um, there is a provision in the Lands Protection Act that says that if a person um, acquires land and has to, uh, is a non-resident. If a person acquires land and then they leave the province, they don't have to get approval when they become a non-resident, okay? You know, maybe someone can make an argument that if you're a non-resident and you got restrictions and then you become a resident, does the rule go back the same way? I don't know, okay? Um, now when you become a, to acquire land and you're a non-resident, you have to pay 1% to IRAC if you're buying more than five acres of land or 165 feet along the water as a fee, okay? Um, you know, maybe there should be something that says that if you become a resident within the province within the next year, maybe you get part or all of that back. I don't know. I don't know. There seems to be a lot of discussion these days in Ottawa and here about what a residency is. Um, in order to be a resident, uh, according to the statute, it's 165, uh, 183 days the year. It doesn't say you have to be consecutive. You know, what's fair for the goose is fair to gather. I don't know. Um, all I know is this: that unless we have laws. And the application of these laws that seem logical and reasonable in their application, you get to a point where honest men and women end up doing some things that cause the matter of law into disrepute. And that is not a healthy thing for society. On the same point in time, I, if there's one thing that I didn't think that, let me put it another way. If there's one area that I have learned a lot about in this whole process, it's been crop rotation. And if the other Friday, well, we went to Calgary for Easter, hadn't seen grandkids since last August. And we got home Thursday night. I insisted that by, before I left, that Friday afternoon I would have two or three hours that afternoon devoted to learning more about crop rotation from the people at the Department of Agriculture, okay? And it was an eye-opener, okay? It was an eye-opener for a whole bunch of reasons. It was an eye-opener to find out that there are very few people that submit, um, what do you call it, stuff, applications for crop rotation. Because it's sort of like a one deal, you do it once, and you never have to do it again? Well, I just don't understand that. Like, I really don't. Um, like, I couldn't understand. Like, I thought that this crop rotation program, it was something where it was sort of done annually or triannually or something like that. I didn't think it was a situation that you sort of somehow 
get through the wicket, it's through the wicket and you're safe and you never have to appear again. To me, that doesn't make any sense. Um, I'm not sure where the obligation is in the farming community itself, okay? Um, sh surely you guys, if I, you want me up around this area a little bit, well, maybe I'll put you in the front vehicle. And you go there, and I say, is that guy a good farm? Is he on a confrontation? You know who does and who doesn't, don't you? I bet you do. So where's the obligation on the farmers? to come forth and say, this stuff is so important that we're not going to trust it all to those enforcement officers over there. I don't know. There's just something here that there has to be more of a buy-in here, guys, about this stuff. And if there's one thing I've learned in this process, it's stewardship and the how we deal with the soil. And I think I, I don't own any land in Prince of Dallas. I don't own any private shares in a company that owns land in Prince Town. My wife owns, I said half an acre, but I think it's really four tenths of an acre in Charlottetown. And that's where our house is. Actually, we live in the garden where John Hamblin Gray had his garden when he was Premier of the Province in 1864. And he was the chair of the, the, the conference. Okay. And somewhere along the line, I made the suggestion one meeting that I thought there was an obligation upon farmers to help the Enforcement Crop Rotation Act. And I was politely told by a wonderful gentleman who I actually have a lot of time for, he says, no, that's the obligation of the enforcement officers. And my response internally is, no, that's the obligation of us as a community, how we make that happen. And I don't see that if we have certain benefits given across the board, let's say we Anyway, I don't see that if we give certain benefits across the board in my report, that the fellow who has not been doing a good job at crop rotation should receive the benefits for somebody who has been doing a good job. I may have got too many double negatives in there. But you see what I'm saying? And somewhere along the line, agricultural farmers in this province have got to come to say that it's unacceptable. Uh, farming practices and be prepared to stand behind it. Anyway, I'm in a bit of a rant. It's getting close to the end of the meeting. So I thought I'd tell you that I am disturbed about crop rotation and the fact, and I don't know if it's a drunk or a speaker, but I know this. In any case, we have made the decision when it comes to highway driving that there are rules and there are regulations and when there are violations, something happens. If we believed that there should be no rules for the highway, there wouldn't be a Highway Traffic Act and people could drive as little or as much as they want. Okay? And I think it's unacceptable in the agricultural community in Prince Edward Island to have 25% of our farmers in violation of the Crop Rotation Act. It's unacceptable. It just is, and I don't know what the solution is. Now, Bertha, I feel you want to say something, and, and I probably have provoked people to say things, but that's okay. Days early. No, I'm not reacting to your okay. comment. I've been just making a few, and uh, I'll try to be sensible. I have a, just a few notes scratched down. You're I, always I, sensible, Bertha. I, I wanted to thank you, first of all, Horace, because I think... I, I've missed four of the meetings, but that likely means I've been well, to 10 or 12. You've been to a great majority. Um, I think the two-way dialogue has been so beneficial, and I think you've facilitated that. And I think back to the court case where you said, I think we can talk this one out. Yep. I, I really think there's a lot of benefit in it, and uh, maybe if we had more time, we could reach consensus, because a lot happens when people understand. And I think uh, just one example of that is in Cropo the other night when Gary Linkletter answered questions for a long, long time, not knowing any of the questions that were going to come to him. And really, they were from people that had no background in agriculture. And he was open, honest, transparent, and calm, and hiding nothing. So that's the benefit of the two-way communication. What I've observed in these meetings over the, attending them is I think people automatically quickly object to raising the limits because of several reasons. One of them 
is they, they think the Lands Protection Act is a protector and a savior and it protects us from everything and I guess it does protect us in many ways but you've told us many ways it can be abused and there are loopholes. So people automatically don't know all of that. They see it as a protection. I think number two, people think of more potatoes and, and potato farmers are largely painted with the same brush. And uh, I, I think we've also heard that there likely won't be more potatoes, that you know, the, the United of Canada is saying there needs to be 7,000 acres less. Uh, there, you know, we also heard, we don't know, there could be more. It depends on, on uh, how we do in terms of uh, growing our productivity, I guess. But I, I do agree with you that we have to use education. And, and for the 25%, or whatever the percentage is, I'm not sure it is that high, personally, but I know that figure came from the department. Um, we have to take it into our own hands. And I've heard that from various people. I talk often to a friend who's now a mink farmer in Nova Scotia, and he was a hog farmer for many years and when transitioned to mink. And they've had a lot of environmental issues. And he has said, you know, if we don't deal with it ourselves, somebody, somebody will. And I'm not sure regulation is the way. I, I believe that every time you make a rule, people find a way around it. And I think education is, is, and cooperation is a far more, uh, a better way in the long run. Uh, the other thing I think is a lot of people presume corporate is bad. And that's really unfortunate. John Jameson showed a slide the other night in Charlottetown where you know, probably 90 some percent of the farms are in an incorporated picture and there's a tiny, tiny uh, uh, bar of corporations that are not farming and they include like your pasture, your community pastures and so on. Unfortunately, people, when they say the family farm is dying, I don't agree with that. I think that, you know, Vernon and Bertha Campbell is a corporation, but we're also the face of the family farm. So, uh, you know, I hear the terms industrial farm and factory farm, and I like to ask what, what the definition is, because a lot of these terms are thrown around kind of loosely. Um, you know, some people say that a factory farm, the definition of a factory farm is a farm that has one more animal than you, or another acre of potatoes than you. It's all a very, comparative thing. Uh, just to move on a little bit to Tim's presentation, I want to thank him. It was pr thought provoking. I did find it compl uh, complicated and uh, it didn't quickly resonate with me, although maybe through time I would get to understand it better. I did like the fact that, you know, he said discretion and flexibility is needed and I heard that from Armand here. And every now and then at a meeting there would be a magnanimous person who would stand up and say, if there's a farmer that's doing a good job and needs more acres, I'm okay with that. And I, I think that when people really understand uh, the issue, that we get to that point. My, uh, my final point is just to go back to what Raymond Moore said, and Raymond Moore was the lawyer that wrote this act. Uh, and he kind of scolded us a little bit, I thought. He said, you know, your generalizations are not helpful, and probably I've made a lot of generalizations, but um, what, what, what uh, Horace needs are facts and figures on profitability and size and scale and so on. But he also went on to say that one thing Horace Carver cannot do for you is he cannot stop the economic forces. And, and uh, Allison alluded to picking up 67 milk cans on his tour to Summerside, my father-in-law, Johnny Campbell, had about the same route. I think he told me he had 60-some stops. Now there might be one or two dairy farms, and our processor, ADL, is, is now with, with Dairy Town, and that's the same of the cooperative dairies in the Atlantic provinces. Farmers has gone with AgriPur. So those are the forces that we can't stop. So I'm gonna stop there, and I just want to uh, say I really appreciated hearing from everyone here. I really appreciated hearing from all all of the farm input here today is yeah, thank helpful. You very much. Karen, Karen Cobb, I know you have uh, perhaps haven't gone to 11 or 12, but you've gone to uh, quite a few. And you were actually, when I came in today, I think about the first person here, and I recognized you from, from just as I came in. I said, well, she's here again. And, and you sent me, uh, you hand delivered to me uh, a very thoughtful, a very thought-provoking uh, submission at the end of Crapple. 
Uh, do you have any comments you'd like to make? Because right now we are farming the marginal land that Bertha and Vernon possibly can farm in our area. And by that I mean the hilly slopes, so on and so forth. We have the manure capabilities to foster most of the land that needs the organic matter in our fields. And that's my big grant is organic matter because Long River is suffering, and I mean suffering big time. It's unreal to see what's going in those waters there. And if anything, I would love to see, and I know it can't happen, a four-year rotation, if the organic matter does not need 3%. That would be a dream of mine, I know, and it would likely be a great thing to happen, but I don't know if it will or not. The other thing is, um, I don't know how to put it. I find it sad some, sometimes to see it's, it's bigger, it's smaller. It's bigger, it's smaller. Well, I'm sorry, but we have to coexist here. And if we can't gather a little bit of um, <coughs> unanimity, 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 I can't even say it, uh, between the larger firms and the smaller firms, we, we can't expect uh, the world outside of agriculture to do it either, really and truly. And that's the rant. Well, it's not a rant. Um, I was going to ask the gentleman who took this call if he'd like to make some comments here. But uh, it's a question. In your absence, uh, I got unanimous support in the group to ask if you would like to make some comments when you come back. Never leave the room. <laughs> well, would you like to make some comments? I know you were on, yes, actually. <laughs> I guess uh, I, I do have a question. Okay. What is, is a per farmer required to report their land holdings in the rental agreement to Iraq? A individual farmer has uh, the right to, to have an interest in, they call it a land holding. They don't talk about ownership of a thousand acres. So it can be ownership, it can be land that you lease in, and at the present time it also includes land that you lease out, it includes easements and things like that. And um, so when you get above 750 acres in that category, then you have to report to them on an annual basis. Thank you very much, uh, appreciate it. When you get above 750 acres, even though you're within um, another quarter to go, you have to report annually. Okay, so that has to happen. And then when you get, as a corporation, the same thing is I think 2,250 acres. And then you can apply to get global leases and things like that about annually and back and forth and so forth. There, there's a fair bit of paperwork uh, to it. Um, it is, and most people don't do it themselves. At least they don't do it early on themselves. If they can get into a rhythm where things are okay and they don't have any shifts, and you just have to tick off that you no changes, 
um, but it's uh, it's a fair bit of paperwork. It, it really is, and the people I've listened to have found it reasonably cumbersome. Yeah, well, that's one of my concerns. Uh, we firm uh, between four and five hundred acres, but I trade with a, a neighbor who's a paid farmer. And if you double count the acres, I believe we would be over that threshold. Well, they're not the only one. Well, that's what I understand. Uh, hopefully, boy, my name is uh, John Dennis. Yes, John. I'm from Port Hill. Uh, we uh, we have 45 dairy cows. And, uh, we have 10,000 laying hens. Really? Which makes me the second smallest commercial lay producer in Prince of Wales. That's the next round. <laughs> in a mixed farm, yes. <laughs> anyway, uh, as far as land ownership, I'm nowhere near a thousand paper limit. But uh, this uh, burden of paperwork concerns me. Uh, when I, since we've rented a lot of small parcels from numerous landowners, you can get a global lease arrangement approval of IRAC. I have. I'm not going to write the report this afternoon, but I have heard a tremendous amount of individual stories. And thank you, Bertha, for your comments. One of the things that I really tried to have happen here, because I knew that if we just had formal presentations and submissions in advance, this was not going to work. But somewhere we had to be able to listen and hear each other, OK? And at the end of the day, I think that's been very helpful. But one of the things I have heard is the burden of paperwork and so forth and details. And uh, you know, we, I, I, I've drawn f over the years thousands and thousands of deeds. And what I always sign off is every other lawyer does, X acres a little more or less. Okay. Well, when you fill out your IRAC application things. If you tried to put in a little more or less, ain't going to go. We are into the second decimal point in calculations there. Okay. Um, you know, I think that John raises a good point. I think there's a lot of people who take a dairy farmer that owns 400 acres and maybe rents another 400, controlling 800 acres. He or she legally should be reporting, correct? Unless, unless for some reason they buy a piece of property, buy a warehouse, do something that has to be buying, they may not know that they're supposed to, and that's when these things kind of come to light. Yes. And then it concerns me a little bit. You say that most people have to get someone else to fill out the forms. I believe that's true. That kind of concerns me. Uh, how complicated are those forms? Well, they, they must be quite we, listen, we, listen, we listened to Allison talk about trying to get some land he identified. He told us how he did it. Uh, I thought he made a terrific contribution to the meeting in that regard. Let me put it another way. I fill up forms a lot. Less forms these days because I'm doing with this form. <laughs> but filling out a form is not as simple as people think it is. It's reasonably complicated. I'm not talking about this. Because usually this is whatever. And if it isn't done correctly, then it sets you back. You've got to go over again and this and that and everything else. Um, there's just something not quite the way it should be in all this. I'm not suggesting someone has gone out and attempted to do this and do that. What's happened is, is there's been add-ons, and there's this and there's that and everything else uh, to the whole process. And there's misunderstanding and education. There's just a whole bunch of things. There's misinformation, there's miseducation, and there's been Various changes made over the statute over the years. And 
regulations have changed and so forth. And what started off with this statute was passed, I was the guy to put it through the legislature, Green McLean asked me to take the Legislative Committee on Agriculture that was headed by Gordy Lane and brought back 18 recommendations. The legislature accepted it from both sides, and then I had to work with Raymond Moore spoke at Mega Shell and the legislative drafts. It was unbelievable amount of time to have it. And I was on the floor of the house for days on the end answering questions. And I can tell you that if the degree of regulation and application by Iraq and even by subsequent governments that put changes in to deal with certain things, if that had been what was passed in 1982, I would have been shot on the floor of the house because it wouldn't have happened. But things have happened over time. And for example, farm corporations starting off didn't have to apply to IRAC for approval at all. You just have said we're a farm corporation. But what happened? Somebody abused the system. And the first premier gives said, I'm not going to tolerate this. This is an affront. This person's not a bona fide farmer. I was hired to deal with the situation. He thought, and I thought, that I would be initiating a court case. On behalf of the government. I didn't have to do that, because I decided to try to use my skills of showing individuals involved that maybe, based on the facts, another option existed, i.e., it was digested. The regulations were changed. And I know people use the phrase loophole or this or that or anything else. But quite frankly, some of these changes that have happened over the years, they may have had the best intention of time, but their application has caused some anguish and hurt you. I can't, I can't reinvent the world and make it perfect. And, but I am, can I say I'm very pleased that the level of conversation and learning and education has reached the point it has. I feel that like that's become a bit of a success story and I'm awfully, awfully proud of you. I really am. And one of the things that has told me here is that I haven't even told my one or two advisors, I'd like to see a mechanism available after this report is done that may be something to be able to exist that will provide a forum like this that can happen every so often that people can that they can talk to somebody that appears in their hands in their own setting so that we don't have to go as long as we have today. Uh, now, I know that Tom's report made some reference to it. That was only because some people brought it up to me that wasn't their primary focus. So. Um, there are a couple of things I need to ask you. Okay. Uh, one is, when you look at this, there's certain things you're supposed to deal with. I've had lots of suggestions on increasing the land limits and so forth. And provincial, land ownership, um, provincial land use as a number one and ownership trends in rural communities. This is not really about land use this, this inquiry, but there's going to be another task force that's going to go on. And that's the John Henderson one from Technish, and he's going to be doing the land use. But somewhere along the line, all of this stuff about land identification, all these types of things, they ultimately get down to one issue, folks. And that is whether we're going to sow the Prince of Allen from one end to the other. That's it. That, that's real. We're going to sow them. Okay, we're going to sow them. Like, in, in all of these municipalities that have official plans, the land is either sown to agriculture, residential, or well. And then we've got a whole bunch of the areas in the province that aren't sown. 
And if it's sown right now, and you're inside the municipality, then you don't have to have your hand identified and all that type of stuff. Thank you very much, Nelson. I appreciate your candor. Thank you for forcing the other gentleman. When, when is your report? It's going to be done June 30th. And the reason it's going to be done June 30th is that three little grandkids, four and a half, three and a half, and one and a half, are appearing at our place around June the uh, July the 10th. And we are going up here caring and seeing you to spend some time at a time. Do you get a chance? Drop into Grand River. Well, it's a, it's a lovely name, and I, I, I've seen it on the maps. Thank you. Anyway, um, sometime a government, and there have been lots of governments in the last 30 or 40 years that have had lots of reports to decide on both parties whether you're going to sown the land across the province. And until that issue is ultimately addressed with some appropriate um, ancillary matters, a uh, whole bunch of other things, this whole matter of land use and Prince of Allen is never going to be settled. So. Okay. Do I understand the trends in rural Prince of Allen? Yeah, I think I do. I might live in the city. But I understand the trends in rural Prince of Allen. And uh, the people have talked about dairy farmers, so I could still milk a cow, uh, not with machines, but with hand. Ownership trends. Uh, one of the things that I am amazed with is how little discussion there is here in these hearings about non resident ownership. Non resident ownership, guys, is still important. Somehow we have gotten the impression that we are protected here under the Lands Protection Act. That is a policy. It's not true. The existing rules and regulations are such that we could have land grabbing take place in this province very quickly without many people knowing what's going on. This all is of my buyers, firm buyers right now, are all of my buyers. Yep. And I can't find the firms that are looking up for the they, they want to come and they want to farm. Okay. Well, um, I guess my quick quip to that is that uh, if we've got people that want to come and farm our land and want to live with us and become part of us, then what's the difference between those individuals and my ancestors who lost the whole battle below the American border and decided to come up here and be farmers? In fact, my great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, was a tenant farmer in Hazelbrook for approximately 40, 50 plus years. He only got his E a few years before he died at age 90. Um, Have you had much representation at any of your meetings from um, non-island residents? No, it's been a shock. An absolute shock. Uh, Marlene, you were the second real estate agent to appear at my meetings. I've had two or three people stop in the street and tell me they don't appear, but they never do. But some members of my profession tell me that too, and I haven't appeared. I haven't had a presentation from the PI Real Estate Association, which I'm shocked and amazed about what I haven't. But after Della sent me an email, I put her on the spot the other day. She sent me an email the next morning saying that she was really glad that I did, and she felt pumped that she put a contact with the association and tell me to get something in. So maybe I will receive something like that. I'll make sure the I I don't mind call. I really would like to see her. I mean, it's only here because I harassed her too. Yeah. That's well, right. I'm going to give all the credit to you up here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to find land for sale and farmers that want to sell. Uh, the Global Mail business section, page one, February 25th. International billionaires are forking over tens of millions for New York's latest and ultra high end living as a hedge against uncertainty and many are doing it sight unseen. In other words, they have the cash, they're buying it as an investment, okay? And some people have already spoken about that a little bit. Last year, in May 2012, there were two condos in New York that each sold for $90 million each. In February, there was one sold for 88, in June, 70 million, and in November, I guess I was getting a little slack, $54 million. And I know <coughs> people 
think that you know who the wealth in Prince Charles Island belongs to. Probably been passed on a piece of paper with the five names down. We'd probably be have common factors of three or four. That type of wealth that those folks have is nothing compared to that type of wealth. Nothing whatsoever. And the type of people that you're talking about coming from the target agriculture early and all early, that's helpful. And that's really productive to our society. But having land grabs of which they're not invested themselves and living in part of it, that's not going to be helpful to our society. And Angus McLean got himself into trouble with front page challenge, but I'll take Angus McLean any day over Gordon Stinker or Rebecca Kennedy. He said, I am an Islander first, a maritime second, a Canadian third. And he always made the point that there's a difference between a person who is a resident of the province and a person who owns the land here, the land is owned, and they live elsewhere. Okay? And as tough as it is to argue sometimes that position of some people, there is a difference. There is a difference. And it's the type of argument that I had to make to Kretchen and Trudeau and the whole gang of them a long time ago. And uh, we eventually got some support and we sort of won the day on that. Okay. Now, the rules are such right now that if you can be arrested here for 183 days, you can go 5,000 acres land. Now, if these people had $180 million, and they came to me and they said, Carver, give us a plan, not as a commissioner, as a lawyer, how to get this land. Well, I would say, this is how you do it. You come back in two hours' time and I'll tell you how to do it. I need an hour to find some of the type and the rest of the time. And then over about a 12 to an 18 month period, we're going to take the $180 million and we're going to buy land in Prince Rallet we're going to make arrangements to do certain things, move people here, and we're not going to apply to IREC, and we're not going to get accepted council approval because it ain't needed. And I don't know how much $180 million would buy land in this province. I think it would buy a lot. It would buy my place. I didn't say that. I said that we could take all of that man. Um, well, I guess he's okay. He's going to play out. He's on crutches. He has two. Uh, but what you would do is you would, as somebody said the other night, you would have 500 people decide to move into the province, become a resident of the province for 183 days, therefore have the right to buy land. Now, would the students who are attending the University of Prince Edward Island qualify? It's going to come down to a couple of things. Are they a resident of the province? Or is their residency still where their parents live? I don't know. But I can tell you that you can make an awfully good argument that those 500 students, you say to a student, go to the University of Prince Edward Island and buy this particular piece of land and up without. There are ways to be doing that. And yet at the same time, we have to be careful the type of signals we send to people like my young Dutch person who came here and your clients and so forth. And uh, we have to be careful. So but all I'm saying is that this land, when I hear people tell me the Lands Protection Act, they don't want to tinker is the word to use with it at all because everything's so wonderful and safe, this is not. This is Now, I want to ask a couple of questions and I'll wrap it up. Um, one is red tape. We've talked about red tape before and so forth. And then number three, legislative concerns have arisen involving such issues as land holding limits as they apply to utilities. And thank you, Margaret, for saying you're not going to talk about uh, Lee Mills. I appreciate that. Uh, is that American Electric and Bell Alliance, if you count the easements, which in the, in the last few years, IREC have started to do, 
it probably means the American electric is very close to its uh, amount of acreage that it's they pick. So we all like electricity. My first visit here is no electricity. Okay. So some people are suggesting that we don't have easements applied to account in maritime electrics and holdings and other utilities like that. Uh, what do you think about that, folks? Do you agree with that? So every time maritime electric has an easement they, over somebody's property, that... That's the way IRAC has been counting that for the past three or four years. So it means that if I have a cottage lot down here, and I need a 66 foot easement up to the road, that when I have the cottage lot down here in order to get the electricity, American Electric needs an easement, and this easement here is going to be counted in American Electric's land holding, and that will push them up over 3,000 acres. Would that, would that be double counted by the owner of the property? Yes. That doesn't make sense at all, does it? Fair enough. In fact, in that particular instance, it's probably going to be counted three ways. I'm going to be counted as a property owner, American Electric is counted as the owner of the property. Triple count. Yeah. And the guy that rents it the next year. Well, if it was a roadway, it probably wasn't being rented so much. Uh, then the application is applied to multiple owners. Uh, there's a there's a certain way that if you had if that was 50 acres of land and it has some water on about 1,500 feet and somebody wants to sell it and uh, the person wants to sell it to is a non-resident and the person doesn't want to go through Iraq because they don't want to have uh, restrictions put on it then the person who's buying it says well I'm going to put it in my name and nine of my relations. And then by zigzagging back and forth through the complicated family tree with about seven or eight keys, they can sort of make that happen. And some people, including government, have asked me to look into that and uh, see what I think about it. Like a lot of issues, nothing straightforward, but that's what that particular thing means. And the next one there says, Information and deeming requirements for non-profit corporations. The rules are reasonably clear. It's a profit corporation. We're the, we're the kind of spoke about corporations and so forth. But non-profit corporations like churches, religious bodies, organizations, uh, education groups, and everything like that, there are no shareholders because it's not for profit. And uh, you still have to apply to get your approval, but it's, uh, it's an area that uh, some people have some concerns with. Would the monks be in that law? According to the opinion of some, probably yes. And they want a lot of land. Well, they have uh, applied through religious organizations to apply, uh, but they have to get court approval for that. And then they have individual members of the society who uh, are individuals and the rest of the around so they can be able to qualify for the thousand acres. Now we've been here for almost three hours and I've never got one of my favorite questions. I'll just pose it and I'm call it basically, but um, I'm not sure why I, as a Charlottetown lawyer who's not involved in agriculture, has the, the necessity or the need is the proper word to own or be able to own a thousand acres of land for this property. If we believe the stewardship, and you ask the most, one of the most penetrating questions at any of my meetings in O'Leary, when I say, okay, what are we going to do with something I mean, you said to Peter? Well, what's the best for the land? I don't know. Is it the best for the land that Horace Carver be able to own a thousand acres and I'm not going to farm it? All that stuff. But somewhere along the line, somewhere along the line, we have to be able to look with a little longer vision down the road. At the same point in time, we need to garner and gain more support for different things. We've got to see less uh, conspiracies, and we need to have a greater appreciation of what we're doing here 
is of the long-term nature. Now, before I got appointed this commission, and I applied for it, it was ad in the paper in September, and I, it was a tough year last year. We kind of turned around. Uh, it seemed that something was happening. Uh, there was someone that I respected was passing on. But anyway, I said to my wife, we've got to go dodge. Saw this in the newspaper, applied for it, went away to Europe for a month and came back. And thought I was going for an interview, but I found that I had been selected. Uh, other people had applied as well. But previous to that, you know, I was saying to my wife and very close friends, they said, what do you think of going on? Just, you know, chit chat on different issues. And I said, I can't explain it. But I'm not sure where we're at. I'm not sure. But my gut instinct and my head and my heart tell me, I've said this for the last couple years, Prince of Allen's going through a rev revolution. I don't know what the revolution's going to produce. But I think the revolution has to do with change. And I think the change that we will see in Prince of Allen in 25 or 30 years, we will look back upon this time as having played a tremendous role and I don't know which way it's going to go. I just think we're living in a very unique time for Prince of And it's going to require greater trust and understanding of other points of view working together and less finger pointing and less accusations. And uh, so I appreciate all of your thoughts and suggestions. Don't hesitate to take a card. And, uh, the report is going to be done in June. I'm going to submit it to the Accepted Council Cabinet and then um, in serious consideration. Many of you are part time journalists, are you? <laughs> oh, yeah. You're, you're, you've become tone deaf, haven't you? <laughs> haven't you, Mr. Perry? I'm considering asking for. Premier permission if I could uh, perhaps reconvene a meeting with the Charlotte Hotel to make my report public afterwards. And that would be highly unusual and, uh, and uh, to answer any questions. Anyway, you've been, and one of the, having said, I don't want you to get the impression I'm pessimistic about, it. I just think we're going to change. But I have been so impressed so impressed by the, the excitement, the integrity, the uh, articulateness, and the thoughtfulness of citizens across this province. And uh, as I've said to you, it's up to a thousand now, uh, 600 of Kennedy's meetings, and 350 besides I've spoken to. And if I was doing the job that I did, Hal Perry 30 years ago, and Angus McLean running the roads looking for candidates to stand for political office. I would have a long list of potential candidates. I just think that it's absolutely fabulous. And yes, there's some private problems I don't know that well. And people I knew best in this particular area were Eddie Clark, and he kindly dropped in and he had a personal reason for health friendship. He had to leave. And the other person I knew was Leon Samaritan. And I realized that when I was coming here today, I had. I had sent Florence a note, so I did that. He was a terrific gentleman, and uh, he had, in my opinion, uh, something that I think we need to see a little bit more in public life. I always felt that he was a reluctant politician. Um, he ran in the by election, Alec Campbell went after him. Reluctantly, he stood. He was a reluctant cabinet minister. First premier of his heart. And then I don't think he was that keen on, um, at least Florence was leaving here to go to government house. And I always thought he was reluctant. And, uh, and as Angus McLean would say, the offices sought the man as opposed to the man seeking the office. And, uh, and uh, he was sure dedicated. Uh, and there's a scribble in the bottom of it. I know that Florence uh, sure missed having those biscuits that you used to make at the uh, government house when we used to invite the former MLAs every summer for a barbecue there. She was one fantastic and chef. Anyway, 
Um, the wonderful thing about this is there's no agenda, and I'm going to stay here for a while, and I want to thank you. It's been wonderful. I really enjoyed it. Thank you.